This is my channel's monthly compendium for the month of November 2023. Enjoy. Case file number 1327, written by TH Dan7. The Island of Inexplicable Silence. It was a nice and sunny day by the sea at our summer cabin. My cousin and I took my grandpa's boat and went exploring a bunch of islands nearby. We live in a place with a bunch of archipelagos. After a while, we got to this island a little further out. We cruise along the shoreline when we notice a small opening, just big enough for our boat to fit through. It was definitely man-made, so we decided to check it out. After about 50 meters or so, sorry Americans, I'm European, we arrive at the pond, and it's almost perfectly round. At the other side of the opening, or canal, we see an old gazebo that's barely standing. We get to the middle of the pond, and then we notice it. Every sound we heard earlier has gone quiet. No seagulls, no wind, no nature noises. The only thing we can hear is the sound of us rowing. I can only describe the lack of sound as thick silence. It was weird. Of course, the sun vanishes behind some clouds, and suddenly the pond seems extremely dark, although it was very shallow. We were trying to joke about ghosts coming to get us, but both of us were clearly nervous. Out of nowhere, a plank in the gazebo falls from the roof and lands with a loud bang on the floor. We nearly jump out of our skins. We both decide it's time for us to go, turn the boat around and start rowing. We were almost at the opening again when we heard what sounded like groaning and thumping coming from the gazebo. Keep in mind, I was facing the gazebo while rowing. I saw something move behind it, but I couldn't make out what it was because I was panicking. When we got out, back to the regular world, everything was normal. Wind, birds, natural sounds. Even the sun came back. We have no idea what the hell happened back there, and it could very well have been some animal, but that whole place felt wrong, and the wind didn't stop because of a nearby predator. Someday, we will go back again and see what happens. Bonus file written by Corrupt173, The Two-Tone and The Unknown. I did an art show in Coventry, UK, at an old building which used to be where the ska band and the specials rehearsed in the damp, graffiti-stained basement. If you are from Coventry or was ever in the two-tone ska movement, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. It was late November or early December, and I was in a busking band playing Christmas songs while people came to look at the installations inside. That night, a paranormal experience team was holding a free session after the event, so myself and my girlfriend tagged along. We are not firm believers in ghosts, ghouls, and demons, but we like horror movies and have never done one of these, so it sounded fun. We explored the whole building, feeling for cold spots and energy. This place is massive with three or four floors and upstairs is all art studios, so they are vast and untreated, especially sonically. It was all going well, and us and the team had decided that one of the rooms upstairs had a weird feeling about it, and of course, we hadn't been into the basement yet. At this point, we split the group in half into two teams. One team would go into the studio upstairs that had a weird feeling, and the other down into the basement. We would then swap later. We were in the basement first. We were led down the stairs and armed only with torches, beginning to explore the cold, dark, wet rooms. The team told us it used to be a youth center, so they tried holding hands and talking to the space to see if they got any response. All quiet, nothing. It was windy that night, so we'd get the occasional leaves sweeping past the window, but generally it was a disappointing response. During one of these communication exercises, I was drawn to a long dark corridor that had small rooms on the right and led to a stairway on the left. I didn't separate from the group, but something kept me looking back into the dark void. After a few attempts and a few jokes made about the lack of activity, it was at this point that we decided to swap the teams around. As people made for the door at the far end of the room, I took one more look into this corridor where I saw or thought I saw or imagined a young chap wearing blue jeans, white trainers, and white t-shirt. He was blonde and had a noticeable silver chain around his neck that he wore over his shirt as a sort of statement. I can still remember his stance and everything. It was surreal and spooked me a bit. At the time, I convinced myself that my brain had just filled in a space. 
I was told I was a use hunter, so my brain, desperate for a result after a few hours in the dark, just put a young man in the darkness. I thought about bringing it up at the end, that we should talk about our findings, but I wasn't sure if I would. We went upstairs, which had a few noises answering our responses. They could have been the sound of radiators or old pipes, but it was fun and eerie at the same time. We all met up again at the main reception room downstairs to conclude the evening. The usual speeches of, join us again, discount, blah blah blah, was most of this, but just before leaving, they asked for any final thoughts. I said to myself that what I saw was probably nothing, it was late, let's all get home kind of attitude. That was until a middle-aged lady, one of the other group, said that she was sure she saw a tall chap in white downstairs. I tuned into every word. He had white shoes and was just peeking around the corner in the basement by that long stairway. She continued to say that she wouldn't have noticed him if it wasn't for a silver necklace shining around his neck just as she was leaving. I didn't tell anyone that night what I saw, not even my girlfriend. There was no way the mediums or paranormal team could have constructed this for a result while we swapped locations. That was a creepy day for me. I haven't had a chance to go back there since, but do park along the road when visiting shops nearby and I'm often reminded of the figure in the dark corridor and how a stranger described the exact same thing from a separate group. Case file number 1328, written by Salt Girl 61 The day the sky shattered with the Columbia disaster. One beautiful winter morning back in 2003, I was sitting in a glider, reading a story to my toddler. Suddenly, I heard a loud crash from upstairs, and the house shook. My heart stopped, as I was alone with the baby. My husband had left earlier. I was too scared to go upstairs, so I quietly crept around and checked the doors, all still locked. There were no strange vehicles nearby. We lived in a rural area, and our house was set back from the road. I couldn't see anything such as a ladder that would aid someone in climbing up to the second floor. I finally told myself that vibrations from passing cars had made something big such as a TV or bookcase fall over. The house felt empty so I relaxed somewhat. I still didn't want to go upstairs though. I turned on the news, which I never do on a Saturday, and watched as a newscaster at the Kennedy Space Center announced that the space shuttle Columbia was several minutes late in arrival. Then a minute later, there were reports of a loud explosion overhead in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Though I was a couple of hours east, I slowly realized what the loud noise was. A pilot friend of my husband called, asking for him. I told him, Did you hear the space shuttle blew up just a while ago? He said, That can't be. I was at the airport just then taking pictures of it as I flew over and, Oh my god, I took pictures of it breaking apart and didn't know what I was seeing. I thought the streamers might be ice or something falling off. He did indeed have a family set of photographs, which he duly submitted to NASA. Creepy file number 129, written by Long Jumping Block 685, Red Lights in the Park. I was walking my dog one day in the park. The park is pretty big, with a lake and a part where the path leads through the woods. Me being a dumbass, I forgot it was getting dark early, but decided to continue walking. My dog is pretty big and protective, so I felt safe enough. She was walking loose ahead of me. Her collar has red lights in them. When we turned the corner through the woods, it was getting darker and darker, and even though I knew the park like it was my back pocket, I turned on the flashlight on my phone. Anyway, a few minutes go by, just silence, sounds of my footsteps, and the wind in the trees, when my dog suddenly started growling. I stopped. She's standing a few feet away, just a ring of red lights staring around the trees. I call her and she's by my side in a second. I don't know why, but I dismissed it as dumb doggy behavior, like smelling a rabbit or whatever and kept walking. Very stupid, I know. So we keep walking, dog by my side, my flashlight in front of me. We turn another corner and my dog growls again. This time I freak out a little, and look around me with the flashlight. Nothing. It was just a minute of walking before the path led us back into the park. I could make a run for it, but I had this weird feeling. So I took a few steps forward and saw someone standing a little way from the path, just standing there, like he just appeared out of nowhere. It was weird and I immediately felt nauseous. 
My dog starts full on barking, growling, back hair standing up. She's a very social dog, even with complete strangers, so this had to be bad. Her barking kind of shocked me into moving. The moment I grabbed her to turn around to make a run for it, the figure stepped forward. I never ran so hard. I ran all the way back to the little bridge that connected the neighborhood to the park. My dog was still with me, thank God. The moment I got home, I called the local police and asked them to check it out. They didn't take it that seriously because nothing had happened, but they sent a car over. They found nobody, of course. I slept badly that night and took me a while to walk there again, even in daylight. Bonus file written by Mostly Gray, The Shared Sense of Dread. My dad, my brother and I were at a house with several outbuildings that my uncle had bought to fix up and sell. My uncle was showing us around. It was a very weird place. It had Wayne's coating over a door in the basement and a long tunnel running to the outside with metal teeth over the end. You could see sunlight through the tunnel. It was just big enough for a small man to crawl through. On the main floor at the back was a room with a lock on the outside. The room's walls were covered in black plastic, no windows. The floor was painted blue with milk paint. I felt an immediate sense of foreboding and refused to stay in the room. My brother and I went and looked at the Quonset house that was on one of the outbuildings. It must have been set up for a family member. Upon opening the door, we found the main room almost knee deep in kids toys. We walked towards the front where the kitchen was. There was no door, just a curtain. I immediately had an intrusive thought that told me there was a family in there at a four maker table with silver edges. The mother was cooking and there was a man and two kids there. I completely felt that is what I would see. I could see the table and kitchen were yellow, all of this in my head. I pulled back the curtain and of course no one was there, but I had the kitchen correctly in my head. The entire layout was exactly what I thought it would be. My brother and I turned and left without speaking about it. About 10 years later, I brought it up to my brother about what I thought I would see after opening the curtain. He said to me, That's exactly what I thought I'd see too. Something bad happened in that house. I don't know what it was, but something bad happened. Case file number 1329, written by Black Kirim, 14. Did I see my future self on the tram? I'm not sure if I'm imagining things or if I'm going crazy, but I believe I just saw my future. I mean, I always wondered if people have their future self walking around in the present, and I sometimes wondered if my future self is around too. But I think I should tell you the story now. I was just on my way home from work, I'm currently doing an apprenticeship as a metal worker. Due to some unlucky circumstances, I missed my tram and had to take the later one. When I took the next tram, I took a seat near the door, noticing a man on the opposite side of the door. I didn't pay him much attention at first, but then I noticed something. On his workwear, I could read the first initial of his first name and his full last name. That was when I realized that he had the same last name as me, while his first name also started with the same initial as my first name. After realizing that, I took a more exact look at him, and he did look quite similar to me. He had the same hair and eye color and a similar if not the same hairstyle that I normally have. My hair is currently longer but normally I have it rather short, and even his face did look kind of similar to mine. The only real difference was that he was a bit thinner than I currently am. Of course, he was a bit older, but still, the physical similarities were there. And since I already mentioned his workwear, he was wearing blue overalls looking similar to the one I was wearing, although I was wearing black overalls, but it was the same workwear which you would expect a metal worker to wear at work. It didn't stop there though. He was apparently working for a craftsman company that also seemed to have a focus on electrical engineering. This also caused me to believe that this man could be my future self, simply because I was planning on investing two more years at my local academy of technology in order to become a state certified technician. And while I'm currently working on becoming a metal worker, I'm also open to becoming an electrical engineer, especially if my salary is higher than. The man apparently even lives in a part of my town where I always wanted to live due to close proximity to our local botanical garden. So yeah, I'm not sure if my mind is playing tricks on me, or if I'm going crazy, or if I actually saw my future self, but I definitely wanted to share my story. 
Case file number 1330, written by Merc123. The Mysterious Slapping Boards Friends and I went hunting and camping away from home. We have made this trip annually and sometimes twice for the last 9 plus years. In the last year, we finally moved spots about a few miles down the road from our original one. To set the stage, I'm a two times war vet, so I sleep fast and hard. I slept through rocket attacks, and my wife questions if I'm alive sometimes. We are sleeping in a soft-sided pop-up camper. At about 3am, I'm woken up out of a dead sleep by a noise that sounds like two 2x4 two boards being slapped together. Every 5-10 to 10 seconds, it does it. One time, except it's moving. It's loud and I can hear the echo off the trees. This goes on for minutes and it moves from my right side to my left side and eventually further off in the distance almost following the river we are camped near. No one else is awake or heard it. The next day, we talk about it and they think I'm crazy. That next night though I got my laughs. Again, woken up out of a dead sleep by this thing. This time, everyone wakes up. The same exact sound. The tone, the pitch, loudness never changes until it moves away and then it slowly gets softer, but the sound is exactly the same every time. It only happened two of the three nights we were there. I google and find stories from birds to Bigfoot. It became a running joke. Well the next year we head back down to it again. This time we camped about a quarter mile up from the other campsite by the river. I ended up having to leave early, but asked when they got back if they heard it. They did but only one night out of four. Case file number 1331, written by Anonymous. The scream that stalked my soul. I was 16 and living in a rural area between New York State and Pennsylvania, on the New York side. I knew a girl who lived out in the boonies on the Pennsylvania side, three or four miles away at that, and she wanted me to sneak into her room that night. Me, being the horny teenager that I was, ventured out on foot. She lived on the hill with a dirt road, and you had to walk up said dirt road through a heavily wooded area. On the way up, you can see significantly better than on the way down because of how the end of the woods faces the direction of the moon at night. Walking to her place went without a hitch. It was in the early morning that I began walking home, through the pitch dark woods. Thus, that's where the trouble began. The stretch of heavily wooded area went on for a mile or so. At the end of it is a clearing with a light attached to someone's shed nearby. I was walking on this barely visible road when I heard a rustling, which is normal when you're out in the woods at night. I wasn't alarmed at the rustling, but more so at the fact that I heard something getting closer to me and it began screaming. Soon enough, this blood-curdling screeching was right next to my left ear. I was terrified and couldn't bring myself to stop or look to the side. I could only keep a steady pace and push on. I remember thinking that I just had to keep moving. Eventually, the screaming was directly behind me, and then shortly after, far away behind me. I never once looked back. As soon as I got the light that signaled the clearing, I ran all the way back home. I never really gave much thought to it in the following years except for a story that I heard around the campfires. Some suggested it was a fox in heat, and I considered the explanation to make a fair amount of sense. However, one night I was browsing some local legends and ghost stories on the internet when I found a legend for the area that I walked through. Many people have reported hearing screaming when walking through that area, the story said, and many reported these things happening particularly in the woods. So I did what any sane person would do and called that my signal that I had enough of the internet for that night and went to bed just a little more nervous than usual. Case file number 1332 written by not Nasuna, the Silent Watchers. My girlfriend and I were visiting the Arches and the Canyonlands area for the weekend and ended up heading out pretty late from Moab to get into the Canyonlands, about a 45 minute to 1 hour drive. A few years previous, I'd gone there myself and stayed until the moon rose because that meant people were leaving and as a field recordist, that meant a quiet environment to record in. That night in 2020, the moon was bright and there were a few night photographers there that I ended up hanging out with and it was generally a surreal experience and I felt completely safe. Hoping to have a similar time again with my girlfriend along for the ride and forgetting the fact that maybe the clouds would largely block the moon that night, I drove us up. 
It was pretty dark before we even made it 15 minutes along the drive there. Having been there, more specifically, Mesa Arch, twice before, and this being a borderline spiritual place for me, I didn't even think about danger or anything of the sort. Despite that, I had a sixth sense type of gut feeling pretty early on that we shouldn't head up there that night. Not wanting to freak myself out or my girlfriend, I didn't say anything or think much of it and chalked it up to just being nervous because it was dark. There was a certain vibe along the roads leading up and we noticed there were people leaving the park but no one coming in ahead of us or behind us. The instinct to not continue hit me subtly a few more times and I kept pushing it away like an idiot. I've been very familiar with these instincts over the past years and they've served me well as far as I can tell. I think I genuinely thought I was just scared because it was dark. We ended up at the Mesa Arch parking lot where two cars were parking up and heading out. When they left, it was almost completely dark with only the faintest glow of the moon through the clouds and not a person anywhere near us. Canyonlands is pretty remote. We get our backpacks on, grab a couple of things, and my girlfriend makes sure I've got my concealed carry. She doesn't usually care much, so this struck me as an indication she may be concerned too. We start heading up. It's a pretty short trail, maybe a quarter mile. All we wanted to do was this little bowl-like area, the main destination, and hang out to record some sounds. The area is pretty open, with trees both live and dead scattered around, bushes and small cacti, and rocky slopes that can be climbed in a few seconds. It's a pretty dope scene in the daytime. I've never felt uneasy here previously. We've been doing a bit of travel vlogging so far, so I continued doing that. I genuinely get goosebumps and chills every time I think about this part. It was the weirdest feeling I've ever felt. I felt the instinctual, I should get out of here, I'm being watched, etc. type of feelings before and have several stories to tell from those but I've never felt what I felt while vlogging tonight. This might not seem relevant, but for context, the field recording I do is largely of gathering wood and rock sounds. Canyonlands has Navajo sandstone and juniper wood, both of which sound wonderful when tumbled and rolled around. I think of field recording as an art, yes, but also as a way to appreciate a land in closer way, at least for me, than just taking pictures of it. I feel like I'm capturing the essence of a location in a very respectful way. As I'm vlogging, I felt something I can only describe as a need to show that I was there peacefully and with respectful intent. I didn't hear anything or see anything that would indicate that I needed to show I was here on peaceful business, but I felt it so strongly. Again, I didn't want to scare my girlfriend, so I didn't say this. I figured I was just feeling on edge being in near complete darkness, we could barely see our own feet on the easy open trail. We kept our lamps off to let our eyes adjust to the glow, but I turned mine on to read a plaque. My girlfriend mentioned I should probably turn it off so I don't create shadows and freak us out, so I turned it back off. I also felt like I was spotlighting myself by having it on and I was about to turn it back off before she said that. We continued and the uneasiness only grew. This lasted until we both reached the same exact spot on the trail and stopped at the same time in silence. I think we should go back, my girlfriend said, and I agreed. Never have I felt a stronger feeling of being unwelcome in a place. It felt like we hit a barrier. Not only did I feel unwelcome, it was more particularly the feeling of intruding on a congregation, meeting, or gathering that we were not invited to. I don't know how to describe this feeling at all beside that and it was not a conscious thought, it was just there, as these kinds of instincts tend to be. At that point, I realized I'd been ignoring these feelings long enough and it was most certainly time to go. I have no idea what was going on in that little bowl we were about to reach, but I didn't want to find out. We made our way quickly back to the car. Soon as we got back, we heard a large pack of coyotes quite nearby, but in the opposite direction we'd been heading on the trail. If we continued on that trail, it was not coyotes we would have run into. Still, this felt like an additional cue to leave, and my girlfriend said, that's our cue. I badly wanted to record their yips, but common sense took over and we got the hell out of there. The road, completely devoid of any sign of other people, was particularly eerie. 
Driving back wasn't just trying to get back to our campsite in Moab. It felt like we were escaping, like when you turn off the lights and run up the stairs. Now relatively safe in our car, we discussed what had just happened. Every single unspoken, strong gut feeling I had had, my girlfriend had felt the exact same things at the same times. Both felt the need to show something, someone's, that we meant no harm by vlogging and being chill outwardly. Both felt multiple times both on the drive there and on the trail that we shouldn't go. Both felt at the same time that we were like actors on a stage being watched by a multitude of something. Both felt unwelcome. Like we were crashing a party. Both felt that we needed to go at the exact same point on the trail. None of these were spoken aloud to each other at any point until we were back on the road, get the helling out of there. As we drove, the moon became visible for a bit. I'm not familiar with moon stuff, but there had been a full moon a few days before, and that night it was large, not full though, and red. This was because of the red sand in the air from the windy day we'd had, I think. But my girlfriend said that also meant bad juju. Looking into the history of the region, and even stories of strange happenings at Mesa Arch, I'm sure we avoided something strange and or dangerous. Sometimes the places you love can get spooky things going on when you're there at the wrong time. Case file number 1333, written by Cassidy Lorraine. 1. Kevin, the Crouching Phantom When I was around 15 years old, I lived with just my mom and I had the entire top floor as my room. Imagine a small loft with a door enclosing the room and a big skylight in the ceiling. It was a really cool room, but I digress. My friends and I had started messing around with the occult, doing little rituals and Ouija boards, typical teenage girl stuff, or maybe my friends were just weird. Nothing ever happened with the Ouija board. When it did move, I was convinced from my friends giggling that one of them moved it themselves. It never spelled anything coherent out anyways. One night. After my friends had left and I was tucked into bed, I fell into a really deep sleep. I was probably asleep for three hours before I got the most insane adrenaline surge I had ever had in my life, and I've been in rollover accidents on the freeway. So I mean it when I say I got shocked out of my sleep with my own adrenaline, and it was immediately terrifying. I don't know how, but I knew I was being watched. I laid there with an increased heartbeat, and my eyes closed out of fear because I was so confused and alarmed. Whatever had woken me up like this, with no nightmares I could remember or sounds in my room in the dead of night, probably wasn't friendly. Eventually, I worked up the courage to open my eyes. I want to preface this by saying that I'm not religious, I am a skeptic, I'm still not sure if I believe in ghosts, but what I saw still sends a weird feeling into my gut when I remember it to this day. I opened my eyes, laying horizontally on my bed and right in front of my face was a little boy crouched on his knees, maybe six inches away from my face. It was admittedly very hard to see him. My room was sparsely lit from little moonlight, but I remember he had black hair and black eyes and a grayish complexion, but that could have just been the moonlight. What gets me is that the second I saw him, his expression went from neutral to pure terror, like he was so incredibly scared that I could see him. Then this freaking thing or a figment of my imagination I'll never know, leaned back on his elbows and like freaking crab walked back into the shadows of my room behind the illumination of the skylight. I tell people this story all the time. I sat there in the most insane fear I have ever had to this day, for what felt like centuries, it was probably around an hour, before I got up the courage to scream bloody murder from my mom downstairs. My mom used to tease me about it, because of course she didn't find anything. She named the ghost Kevin, and we started blaming missing things or random stuff happening on Kevin. She thought it was funny, and I played along. But I will never forget what I saw. The adrenaline coursing through my veins made the possibility of it being a dream completely nil. It was so damn weird, and I'll think about it till the day I die. Bonus file written by Whiskey in a Mug. Ghostly Waves. I live in a brand new apartment building with my partner. I had just been discharged from the hospital after having surgery on my broken arm. My partner was at work. I was lying on the couch in my living room scrolling reddit with my two cats asleep next to me. Both cats simultaneously snap awake and look towards the hallway. 
I glance over and see a four foot shadowy figure peeking around the corner at me. I couldn't make out any facial features at all, but I definitely saw a head, shoulders, and one arm holding the corner as if it was balancing itself. It felt playful in nature, and at the time, I honestly chalked it up to the painkillers I was prescribed and moved on. A few weeks went by, I had my cast and stitches removed, and was off said painkillers. My partner and I had the night off together, and so we decided to order takeout and watch a movie. At that point, I got up to use the restroom, and as I was on the toilet, I heard a pitter-patter of someone walking frantically down the hallway. Weird, but okay. When I returned to the living room, my partner asked me why I'd gone to the kitchen and back to the bathroom. I thought it was him. A few nights later, we're in bed when he sits bolt upright and flies towards our bedroom door. It was cracked open so the cats could meander in and out. I rolled over, startled by the sudden movement, and asked him what's wrong. I heard footsteps and it waved at me. What waved at you? Someone is making a shadow in the nightlight. It waved at me through the crack in the door. We cleared the apartment and there was no one there. The cats have become obsessed with crying in the hallway closet, doing the usual weird cat stuff, i.e. there's nothing there, why are you howling, what are you looking at, why are you suddenly so spooked, behavior. Not the creepiest thing by any means, I just can't find any explanation for the sudden presences in a brand new building. Case file number 1334, written by Barnacle Baritone. The bus ride that united hearts. Growing up, I had an acquaintance we'll call M. We went to the same church, the same school. But I was two years older than M, and when you're five, that's a world of difference. I was aware of M's existence, the same way I was aware of the sun. You know it's warm, but you don't really look at it. So I happily passed through high school without thinking much of M as a person of interest in my life. But then I was 28, having gone to college, and loved, and worked just like everyone else until I had a dream. I was sitting on the bus next to a woman. She was older than I remembered, her dark hair streaked with grey, and shorter than it had been when I last saw her. It must have been 20 years since I'd seen M's mother, but it was her, wearing a pair of dark slacks and a crimson sweater with a button fixed to one shoulder. The bus was old, and smelled odd its vinyl seats creaking when it stuttered and screeched to a halt on the side of the road. In my dream, I stood up, but someone on the other side of M's mother made to stand too, and it was M herself. I took her hand and we walked off the bus. Turning around, I saw M's mother give a shallow wave as the doors hissed closed, and the bus roared away from the curb and motored down the street. I blinked awake and it was around 6.30am. I couldn't go back to sleep, because the dream was so vivid. After a shower and a coffee, I picked up my phone and checked my social media. A friend of a friend of a friend had posted that Emma's mother had died that morning, after an elective surgery gone wrong that lasted most of the night. Maybe it could have been coincidence or déjà vu, whatever mental exercise my mind needed to go through that morning, maybe something that triggered it in those days leading up to it. I don't know what it was, but it freaked me up that morning. I couldn't even send my condolences the same way all the friends of friends had done. I honestly just wanted to ignore it all. Then two days later, I was filling up my gas tank at pump number 7, and I saw her at pump number 3, M coming home to take care of her mother's affairs. She was wearing a pair of black jeans, paired with a deep red sweater, an ivory colored button holding the sides of one shoulder together. It's honestly hard to explain what happened next. The awkward hellos that led to long coffee dates, M moving home from the big city, and moving into her mother's house. The first time I held her hand, and it just felt like in the dream. We married two years later, and I never told her about what I saw on the bus. I didn't want to sound crazy. Honestly, for a long time I forgot about it, until we got a cat. The cat had a habit of staring long, for like hours, at one corner, every night. Maybe he sees a ghost, I said idly. And then we had a long conversation about the possibility of ghosts or spirits or whatever. I thought a lot about her mother. Can I tell you something strange? M said. The night my mother died, I had a dream. You were holding my hand. You don't have to believe that this actually happened to me. There are things that I can't explain in this life. 
But I know that the night I dreamed of my future mother-in-law, deceased on a bus, shot my life in a direction I never knew existed. And I'm so freaking grateful it happened. Bonus file written by No Brow Entertainment. The best fried ghosts in town. So I work as a busboy in a little family-owned country restaurant. The building was built in 1887 as a family home, but it was abandoned by 1900. My boss bought it around 2000 and renovated it, and it's now a restaurant. And we have a bit of a ghost problem. Nothing too bad, mind you. Just occasional glimpses and people who shouldn't be there. There's a woman in a rocking chair in one corner who isn't there and a little boy who stares into the oven before disappearing. I've seen one too. It's an older woman dressed in black who sits at the table alone. She seems so sad. I've only seen her out of the corner of my eye while walking past that room. I'll walk past and think, oh I didn't know there was anyone in that room. And then I'll go back and realize I was right, there isn't anyone in that room. By far the weirdest incident though was this. One day, maybe a year ago around 3pm, I'm sweeping the floors and I heard this crashing noise from down the hall. Everyone else hears it too. It sounds like a pile of plates or glass falling over and shattering. But there's nothing. We look through the entire building and nothing's broken, nothing fell. About a month ago, a storm came and a tree fell right through the window in the room I was sweeping in. The same room where a lady in black appears. Anyway, we have great fried chicken. Case file number 1335, written by Damn Did Gas Shrubbery. The Tale of the Snake Premonition. I was nine years old, and I had a dream that I got home from a friend's house, and as I opened the door, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a grey rat scamper along the side of my house, so I stood there for a second, just watching it. Then I looked down and a rattlesnake was right next to my leg. Of course I panic and step back but the snake strikes and bites my leg. I scream and roll around and my leg burns, even in the dream it burned. My father comes out and sees me on the ground and I tell him I was bit by a rattlesnake. He rushed me to the hospital. Time gets real malleable and I don't remember traveling to the hospital or checking in, but I end up on a bed and very distinctly getting a couple doses of anti-venom, but it's too late. I die and I see my mother crying while holding my hand. I watch for a few minutes, then I wake up. Weird as hell nightmare, right? But nothing to freak out about. So I go about my day, play with my friends and whatnot. When I was walking home that evening, I just randomly thought about my dream. So I stopped a bit away from the door and actually looked around where the snake was in my dream. The mother fricker was exactly where I dreamt he was and basically staring at me, but never does rattle. Then a freaking rat goes darting down the side of my house. I change course and go to the front door instead. I tell my dad about the snake. He goes out and kills it with a shovel. I haven't had another dream that vivid of the future since. Crap still freaks me out though. Bonus file written by Bongo1138, The Orchard Enigma. I was in a Christian youth group as a high schooler. It was fun. We'd get together and there was a worship aspect, but mostly it was a way for teenagers to hang out and not get into trouble. We'd all do things together on the weekends, Halo 2 LAN parties, hikes, that sort of thing. One weekend, the group was just going to play flashlight tag. A man at the church owned a large chunk of land just outside of town, and there was an orchard on this property, the kind where the trees form these nearly perfect rows. For safety, we were buddied up and I was partnered with what was basically a junior counselor named Finn. My best friend Matt was partnered with James. Finn and I were it, meaning we carried a flashlight and would be searching for people when we were wandering one of these near perfect roads. James manages to sneak past us and sprint back towards the cars, which I guess had deemed the safety zone. Finn, flashlight in hand, says, stay here, and runs after James, leaving me alone in these woods. Alone and admittedly a little skeeved out, I began to hear movement around me. I thought I had pinpointed the noise behind a bush and started slowly approaching it. Matt? That you? I called out. No response. Creeping closer, I say it again. Nothing. Then I hear movement behind me. I spun around, expecting to find Matt running off, but I didn't. I wish I did, but I didn't. 
Instead, standing before me is something short and stout, dark in color, but shining in the moonlight that had poked through the tree coverage. It had black eyes and stood on two legs. I squinted, thinking it might just be a stump, but it shifted slightly. I bolted back towards the car. I don't know how far it was, but I was back at the car before long, where I stayed for the rest of the game. Sitting on the bumper, I considered what I had seen and figured it must have been a raccoon after all. They weren't uncommon around here. It didn't look like a raccoon, but that's the only reasonable explanation. One by one, kids made their way back to the cars until finally the senior counselor arrived. He was pale and shaking and wanted us to huddle up. He asked that we say a prayer and go, which we did. In the car, I asked him, what was that about? He didn't want to tell me, but I finally got it out of him. I was walking down the path and heard something. I turned around and there was this small, two-legged thing running towards me. I put the light on it and it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. Needless to say, I was freaking freaked out. Case file number 1336, written by Not A Deer. My grandfather's final gift, the guiding light. A couple years ago, my grandfather died and was buried with the ashes of his much beloved Chihuahua. They died about a month apart. Dog was 17 years old and went shortly after we had to move my granddad into a care facility. Not long after, my mom started seeing a little fist-sized ball of light bobbing by the floor and zipping down the hallway, then vanishing down into the floor. My mom is the most skeptical woman I've ever met. You could not force her to admit ghosts may be real, but she saw this little light. Then her dog started seeing it. She'd jump up from a dead sleep and start barking and howling like crazy at the exact path the little light would always take, then go nose at the spot where it would vanish to. Then my dad saw it, accompanied by, he said, the sound of nails clicking on their hardwood floor. One night, my mom wakes up and this light is at the bottom of her bed. She jolts awake, scares dad, and then she said her mind was filled with an image of her dad laughing. Ha! You're scared of me and Jackie. Jackie being his dog. The light faded. My mom had taken the death really, really hard, and she felt at peace after that. Never saw it again, until... I had just moved with my husband into our new house. We'd been looking to get a dog, but hadn't seen one that struck us yet. I was talking with my grandpa, and he handed me a little apricot-colored bully mix puppy. My mom calls the next day. She saw the weird little light again, the night before. I tell my husband about it, and we all kind of just shrug it off. Until two days later, his co-worker says a friend is having to rehome a pit bull chihuahua mix puppy, and weren't we looking for a dog? Bonus file written by Angry Clam 1313 the haunting of Nikita's Martini Bar. I used to work in a small martini bar that was part of a long group of buildings. Think residential row houses, they all shared a basement, which was segregated by 2x4s and chicken wire. I had to go downstairs to get some supplies for the night shift. Me being the explorer, decided to take a walk along the length of the basement. It was about three-fourths to the end when I felt something looking at me. I turned to my left and there was a young man, maybe late teens, early 20s. He was hanging from one of the rafters with something around his neck. He was staring at me. He had so much hate and contempt in his eyes. I froze on the spot for about 30 seconds, ran back upstairs to the bar. There were a couple of regulars there and asked me what was wrong as my face was white and I was drenched with sweat. Before I had a chance to say anything, they said, Oh, I guess you saw him. I'll add some more details. This was Nikita's Martini Bar on Rice Howard Way in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. This occurred about 20 years ago. After that, I went back down into the basement. I didn't ask any of the regulars because I honestly couldn't wrap my head around what I just saw. If I could go back in time, I absolutely would have inquired more. Maybe I just didn't want to know. I believe this row of buildings is still there. There has been a lot of development around the area, so I'm not sure if the spirit has moved on or not. When I say development, I mean for roads torn down to nothing and LRT lines put in, buildings demolished for high rises to go up. These buildings are very close to the arts district. The theater, museum, symphony. There was a restaurant at the end of this row of buildings that was very popular with theater goers. 
Maybe if any of them are on site, they might have more information. Bonus file written by Nilay's The Witten Word When Darkness Beckoned. When I was around eight or nine years old, it was the first time my parents let me stay home alone since they were out doing something, dinner or something of that sort. I can't remember exactly. It was around 10 to 10.30 p.m., I would say, as it was very dark outside. I heard some weird scratching and whispering sounds coming from downstairs. My room was on the top floor, and I was starting to get a little antsy. I opened my door and exited my room. The scratching was getting louder, and whispering was getting more intense. For whatever reason, just about every light in the house was turned off, so when I exited my room it was pretty much pitch black in the hallway, aside from the light coming from my room. I went out into the hallway and flipped on the switch. The light turned on and the scratching and whispering noises suddenly just stopped altogether. I looked down the stairs and I saw a hand and arm curve around the corner leading into the living room and it started to make a sort of come hither motion with its finger. Keep in mind, this hand was incredibly disproportionate to what a normal human hand should look like. The fingers were way too long and the nails were massive. The entire situation was just wrong and I was absolutely terrified. I just ran back into my room and hid in the closet for the next half hour until my parents got home. When they arrived they called me back down and I was incredibly disturbed to find numerous tiny scratch marks etched into the ceiling and walls right beneath my room. I asked my parents if they had been home for a while and of course they said they hadn't. I tried to explain what happened but I doubt that they believed me at all. I still get a weird and deeply disturbed feeling when I approach the stairs, which is an odd fear to say the least. This is easily the strangest thing I've ever experienced, and it still doesn't make sense to me thinking about it now. Case file number 1337, written by Major De, the enigmatic water filter man. Earlier this year, my husband went through a terrifying, life-threatening thing, and not to go into any details, but at one point of the story, he was still bedbound, and we were staying in my parents' house. Some relevant background. My parents' house is big, two floors plus a rooftop apartment plus a basement. It's pretty old though and needs something fixed every month or so. My dad is very old school and he deals with people he likes even if they overcharge him. He's been using the same plumber for years, same electrician, same gardener, etc. This happened back in my home country of Jordan. The country is mostly Muslim, but my family is Christian. So we wake up that day and the whole kitchen is flooded. My dad had recently got a new water filter installed and it was giving them trouble since the beginning. My dad had to leave but he called his water filter guy, which is hella specific, to come fix whatever is going on. The water filter guy said he will be there in a couple of hours. About an hour later, the doorbell rings and my bro opens the door. It's a man in a suit with a little briefcase. My bro thought it was one of the doctors for my husband, so he immediately invited him in. The man immediately corrects him and says he's not a doctor, he's there for the water filter. My mom knows the water filter guy, and this isn't him, but she just assumes that the original guy just sent this guy instead. So my mom asks what he needs. I'm in and out of this whole situation as I care for my husband. So the man went to the roof to look at the water tanks and he took pictures, came back down and sat in the kitchen with my mom telling her what he thinks the issue is, tanks need replacing, and how much it'll cost and all that. So my mom calls my dad and passes the phone to the man who gives my dad the rundown and then my dad says he'll talk to his original guy about the price. Man starts arguing with my dad on the phone to the point that my dad basically yells at him and hangs up. At this point, my mom kind of apologetically asks him to leave and that my dad will just talk to his boss because that's what he prefers. The man says, what boss? She tells him his name and the man says he's never heard of that guy before in his entire life. Now my mom is freaking out. She asks who sent him and he says nobody. So she asks him how much she owes him so she can quickly get him out of the house. He says he noticed the man in the hospital bed and his only payment is that he's going to ask God to heal him. And then he left. And that was that. My dad's actual guy showed up a little later and fixed the filter, but my mom and I were shaken by the whole thing. We talked about it in detail for hours. 
We talked to my dad, and my dad's guy, and the nurse that was there that day, and my bro who opened the door, and none of us could figure out how this happened or who he was. The man just showed up to check water filters on the same day the water filters burst, but didn't want any compensation? This wasn't a scam. Nobody sent him? Like how? It still bugs me. My mom thinks he's a, a freak or a demon. I just don't know. I was going through a lot at the time, so my mind might not have been all there, but everyone else had experienced this? Help? Any ideas? Also, my husband is doing so much better, thankfully. He's about 90% recovered and still healing. Thank you for your kind words, everyone. Bonus file written by Kabeku from Childhood Innocence to Paranormal Mystery. When I was 9 or 10, we had a big family reunion at my great aunt's big Victorian house that her family grew up in, which she inherited. I got bored though because there weren't any other kids my age there, so I went exploring through the house and found a check writing machine in the upstairs office or library. I remember the machine was black and gold and had lots of little levers where you'd select the individual numbers then pull down on another lever to stamp the check. I'd put in pieces of paper that were on the desk and look at the number stamped on it. I was playing with that when I clearly heard another kid in the hallway say, You're not supposed to play with guns, Bill. My name wasn't Bill, and I wasn't playing with guns. I remember saying, I'm not. Then some moments passed and I got curious about another kid, maybe my age, being there. So I hopped up and looked into the hallway to find him, but there was nobody there. And nobody around my age downstairs or outside where everybody else was either. I figured at the time it was maybe some neighbor's kids who ran out. I didn't really think about it again until I was 18 or 19 and my mother told me her father, Grandpa Bill, my great aunt's brother who grew up there too, had accidentally shot his friend in that house when he was a kid when playing with his father's pistol. Then when I was in my 40s, I was driving my great aunt somewhere, now in her 90s, and asked where in the house Bill had that accident, and she said in that upstairs office. I'm not religious, but that just seems too specific. Maybe it's a wild coincidence. I still can't explain it all these years later, and it's the only thing that keeps bugging me in my life. Bonus file, written by Jules Lin, The Night Shift Glitch. I used to work as a sleep study technician at various sleep clinics. When I first got the job, a few of my fellow techs warned me about the haunted clinic. I thought they were joking. They weren't. They told me about the creepy things that would happen there. Some techs refused to work there again. I was already assigned to a couple of clinics and hoped I would never have to work at the haunted one. It was probably a year into the job when the tech who was working that clinic quit and I was asked to take over there starting that night. Dread started building up in the pit of my stomach when I saw that place. It was a creepy old Victorian mansion that was divided up into a bunch of doctor's offices, around 130 years old, based on a little research I did on it later. It originally belonged to some prominent local politician, then was turned into apartments, then into offices. I told myself it was just an old house, no big deal. I walked into the dark lobby, turned on the lights, and walked up the creaky stairs to the sleep clinic on the second story. I took a tour of the clinic, getting myself acquainted with it. I felt fine until I got to what was formerly a kitchen and was now used as a storage or prep room. I started feeling uneasy. Right next door was the final room, which was one of the bedrooms the patients would sleep in. I hated that room. Bad, bad vibes as soon as I stepped into it. I didn't even believe in places being haunted, but that room made me start to consider it. It was always so much colder than the rest of the clinic. Poor insulation, I would tell myself. Doors would swing open on their own. It's just gravity. The doors aren't level, I would tell myself. I would hear creaking floorboards when I knew there was no one else in the building, just the sleeping patients and myself. Old houses creak, I would tell myself. I would think I saw shadows and lights out of the corner of my eye. Just my imagination. That one room kept getting infested with bugs, but never other rooms. The TV in there kept breaking. The light bulbs kept going out. The sleep study equipment would malfunction. 
The patients I put to sleep into that one room would complain. It was too cold. It felt creepy. They felt like they were being watched. No one ever complained about the other bedroom in the clinic. I worked nights in that clinic for a couple years. Finally, one day, at the end of my shift, I woke up the patient who was sleeping in the problem room. I knew she slept poorly based on her sleep study. I asked her how she was feeling. She told me that she didn't sleep well because she kept dreaming over and over again that there were dead bodies in the walls. I could tell she was scared. I couldn't take it anymore after that. After the patients left, I had to go back in that room and clean it up as I trembled and thought about how I was all alone in the building. When I finished up, I literally ran out of the building to my car. I decided to finally quit. Turns out I didn't have to. The doctor decided to close that clinic. I had to work another two or three nights there. Thankfully on those nights, I only had one patient, so I was able to put them in the good bedroom and leave the problem room alone. Case fall number 1339, written by Squeaky TITS 101, The Missing Clothes. This seemingly small incident happened this past Tuesday, and since then it's been constantly on my mind. I'm not wired to just let it go, so I can't stop thinking about it without resolution. Anyways, to the story. I go through the same routine every morning when getting my kids ready for school. I wake up the eldest, walk into the laundry room, attached to her room, turn on the light, and open the sliding door to the living room, go back to the eldest's room, and grab her clothes we laid out the previous night, pinching them together so I don't drop anything. Lay her clothes on the couch and go back, the ten feet, to her room and grab my youngest's outfit, pinching it together and lay them beside her sisters. I then walk back to the eldest's room, the same ten feet I've walked now for the fourth time in the span of under a minute, get her to actually get out of bed so she can start getting dressed. I then walk four feet across the hall and wake her and then I leave the room and let her stay cozy for five minutes or so. At this point I start filling water bottles and signing folders and then go back to the youngest room to get her out of bed and dressing. Now this past Tuesday, everything went according to routine until the transition between six and seven. As I walked out of the youngest's room from her first wake up, the oldest came around the corner and asked, where's my skirt? I told her I laid them on the couch with her shirt and other clothes and walked in there to show her, only to see there was no skirt or underwear. Okay, must have dropped it. I retrace the ten feet and it's nowhere to be seen. I look under the couch, not there. Under the cushions or in the creases of the couch. Nothing but crayons and crumbs. Alright, so the missing skirt is weird enough, but to me, the weirdest part is what is missing. I lay her clothes out in the order she puts them on. So skirt on bottom, then shirt. Then panties and socks laid side by side on top of the shirt. The shirt and socks were there, but the skirt and panties have somehow freaking vanished? This is her favorite outfit that she picked out. I know she didn't shove it somewhere. No one else was awake when I laid everything out. I have tossed my entire house and have come up empty handed. I cannot think of one logical explanation. I'm exhausted from thinking about this and just want to let it go, but like I said, I'm not wired that way. It's coming up in a week and the skirt is still nowhere to be found. What the hell? It's file number 1340, written by Library DJ 0808 Glitches Behind the Curtains When I was in high school, we had a very, very small budget and depended on local shops and thrift stores in the town to give us donations and leftovers for costumes, props, etc. For this play, naturally, we needed a crap ton of plants, so we got some old flowers from the local florist shops and some fake stuff from our own stash of props. The local college even offered to let us perform on one of their stages, so we would have better quality lighting and seating as a favor. It was great! For a week, we did this play and all went well. The last night we ran the show was the night I saw something that I, to this day, cannot rationalize or explain. I had a relatively large part in the play. So most nights, when I wasn't on stage, I was off stage trying to catch my breath and rest a little until my cue came. The last night we ran the show, I decided to watch my peers from behind the set to try to soak in some memories. It was my last play before graduating. From behind the set, as I was peeking out through a window in the flower shop, I noticed small, measured movements on stage a distance away from the actors. I looked more closely 
and it looked like a flower in a terracotta pot was undulating. Its petals were slowly opening and closing in a measured rhythm. I thought I was seeing things, so I literally rubbed my eyes to clear them. That flower was freaking moving. I stared at it for a good minute, maybe a minute and a half, trying to figure out what the hell was looking at. I knew it wasn't a fake flower or something mechanical. I had helped set the stage as a prop manager every performance night. It was a real flower. I had also been working on the set and props for weeks and weeks and knew which ones were fake and which ones were real, donated flowers and so on. This was a real flower in a pot on stage, moving. The best I could figure was that the heat of the lights was causing to, I don't know what, uh, I couldn't go investigate like I badly wanted to because we were in the middle of a scene. The next day, we had so much help from college age theater kids and our own crew that the set got cleared before I could find that particular flower. I told one person about it, and they wrote me off like I must have been seeing things. I get it, I thought I was too. But I stared long enough and looked so closely to make sure it wasn't just me that, well, I'm sure it wasn't just me. It's not scary or even that interesting, but I absolutely cannot explain what I saw. In fact, if anyone has ideas, I'd love to hear them. Bonus file, written by Shirley Unimportant. The Unexplained Hospital Ring Miracle. A few weeks before my granddad died in April, I started wearing two rings I had inherited from a family member on a chain around my neck. I've had them for years and always wear them when I feel like I need a bit of luck or support. Makes me feel as if someone is looking out for me even though I know I don't really believe in the afterlife or the supernatural. I knew he was sick, so I'd not long start wearing them again, only I hadn't put them on a chain this time because the uniform policy at work meant I couldn't wear them as I usually did on my finger. The clasp on the chain can be quite stiff to open, so I just throw it over my head with the rings attached because it's long enough to not have to open. So the rings and the chain had been together for a few weeks at this point, without me ever opening the clasp because there was no need. So I was at work with another colleague about two feet away from me. I had the rings tucked well down my shirt, hanging right around heart level, my uniform zipped up over them, a plastic apron and my gloves on, I'm a nurse. I was busy doing something so my hands weren't anywhere near the rings and I wasn't even thinking about them. There wasn't any way I could have touched them or got them caught on anything. Then I felt something cold touch my stomach and the next thing I knew one of the rings had dropped on the floor. I was confused at how it had happened and I thought maybe the chain had broken even though it's quite sturdy and I didn't want to lose it so I took my apron and gloves off and pulled the chain out of my shirt. The chain was intact and still clasped tightly together and the other ring was still on it. So somehow one ring had come cleanly off the chain without the other one falling off and with the chain still clasped together. My colleague was just staring at me like what the hell and I'm not really a believer in the supernatural like I said. So I just cracked a joke saying I hope that wasn't a sign or someone trying to tell me something and laughed it off. Not five minutes later I got a call to say my granddad had deteriorated and I needed to come home. I left work that day to care for him and two weeks later he died. I know there's got to be an explanation for it but part of me doesn't want to know it because the mystery makes me feel like maybe I was actually being looked out for. I wear the rings on my finger now because I can't shake the feeling that there was something more to that little mystery than the logical side of my brain wants to believe. And frick the uniform policy. If anyone calls me out on it, I'll tell them a ghost told me to wear him. Case file number 1341, written by Kit Kat Patty Wax, The Tale of the White Feathers. My mother always told me to look for signs. She was very spiritual, not religious, but she did believe in angels and spirit guides and all that. I never believed in any of that stuff. But she would always tell me all these entities from heaven would send you signs as long as you were looking for them. License plate numbers, radio stations, headlines on newspapers, and of course, white feathers. She always told me to ask my angels for guidance whenever I was having trouble and to look for white feathers. Well, I joined the military a few years ago and got shipped out to boot camp. I was the underachiever of all my siblings, so it was the only thing worthwhile I had done with my life up until that point. I needed to make myself and my family proud. I had to prove that I could do it. 
I injured my hip during a training exercise near the end and was terrified of not being able to complete the training being sent back home a failure. We had a 20 mile ruck march and a grueling 5 days in the field coming up and I wasn't sure if I'd be able to make it with my bad hip. So as a desperate reach, I asked my angels for guidance. And I crap you not, two minutes later I walk over to my bunk and what do I see laying there on my blanket but a little white feather. And I start seeing them everywhere, on the floor, on my uniform, on my gear, outside even. I don't know if it's just that I didn't notice them all before or maybe the pillows in the bays were getting beat up after being used for months, but I kept seeing them. And I marched 20 miles, killed those 5 days and passed my final PT test with flying colors. Case file number 1342 written by Anonymous, riding with my doppelganger. I was on public transit one time and saw someone that was just about the same height as me and looked to have my body type. I just shrugged it off in that moment, as a taller girl with a slightly bigger frame, it's not that rare. The only seat is one directly across from her, so I sat down and put my headphones in. I tend to watch people while I ride to school, so I started to do exactly that. I took a closer look at the girl in front of me, the same shade, cut and colored hair. Huh. Weird. Her head is down, so I can't see her face, but when the bell rings to tell it's the next stop, she looks up. Oh my lord, she has my face. She looks up at me and blinks twice. Same color eyes. I have very odd eyes. So brown they look black. Her eyes are so brown they look black. She stands up and walks off the bus. I turn to see her go. Sure, my eyes are playing tricks on me. She's gone. It's like she walked off the bus and just fell into a wormhole. I looked at the spot we stopped at. No girl there was creeped out for the entire week. Case file number 1343, written by Bearded Trucker. The Bizarre Events of the Desert Truck Stop I was stopped for the night at a truck stop in the desert, 60 miles east of El Paso, Texas. This truck stop only has lights around the store and fuel pumps. The truck parking lot area is only lit by any headlights that are left on. I get to bed around 2200, thinking it'll be a nice quiet night. At around 2.30 in the morning, I woke up to a tapping on my truck, like someone was trying to wake me up. I ignore it and try to go back to sleep, but the tapping gets louder and louder and eventually turns into a sound similar to someone beating their hand on my door and cab. I got out of bed and opened the curtains to the side. I heard the sound coming from there and there was nothing there. I opened the curtains on the other side and nothing there either. There were no trucks on either side of me, so I threw my shoes on grabbed my machete and flashlight and went outside to see what the hell was going on. There was nothing, no footprints, no paw prints, absolutely nothing there. I get back in my truck and turn on my side markers, so I'm somewhat illuminated. Close the doors, lock them, and run my seatbelts through the door handle and buckle them in to add essentially another lock to both doors. I go back to bed and wake up at around 6.30. The sun is starting to come out. So I go inside for some coffee and breakfast before heading out. Other truck drivers were in there and experienced the same thing I did that night, with no answers as to what it was. I finished my breakfast and noped the hell out of there. Case file number 1344 written by Flebon. A glitch in the matrix at Ace Hardware. I went to Ace Hardware yesterday for a single item that I can only find there. I go to this specific store maybe twice a year so I don't know anyone by name or face. As I set down my item at the register, the cashier says my name. I'm used to wearing a name tag at work so I just say, yep. She asks for my phone number and I provide it for her to type. She confirms my name as it pops up on her screen. I'll add that my name is fairly uncommon. At this point I realize she had said my name twice now but there's no way she could have known it before pulling up my account. I called her out and said, I swear you said my name before I gave you my phone number. We make eye contact for a second and at the same exact time in complete synchronicity we both say, must be a glitch in the matrix or something. I stood there wide eyed and slightly stunned. She seemed completely unaffected. She broke eye contact and said my total was on the screen. I laughed nervously, finished my transaction and left. My brain went many places trying to explain what had happened. Facial recognition? 
in a freaking Ace Hardware? No way. Maybe she knew me? I've definitely never seen this woman. Am I on some kind of list? Is she an all-seeing, all-knowing demigorgon? Glitch in the Matrix? Probably not, but I thought it would be fun to share. Case file number 1345, written by Cartulinas. The day the chicken spoke. Rural Spain in the countryside. Me being around 10 years old. When I was a kid, my father used to buy me a couple of chickens for the summer. Then my aunt would raise them and sadly, we eat them. I didn't know this at the time. That summer, I was raising two chickens. A dyed pink one called Poliana and a dyed green one called Maximiliano. Yes, I was a bit dramatic naming pets. I was sitting on the porch of my house reading Harry Potter and the chickens were around eating things and going for a dander. At some point, they went down the street, field, and I couldn't see them. They had been over there before and they were always fine, but not that day. Suddenly, Maximiliano, green, came running towards me making a lot of noise and tweeting, chicken shouting very loudly at me. It was very, very stressed, very loud and moved its wings and body like telling me, help, help. I stood up and went behind him as he took me down the street. There I found my pink, Poliana, lying down, facing up and a dog on top of her with its mouth in my chicken's body and hurting Poliana. I was afraid, only 10 years old, so I took a stick and threw it at the dog so it got scared and it ran away. Luckily it did. I came closer to Polly. It seemed to be dead and had blood all over. I kneeled down to pick her up in tears, but as soon as I came close, it opened its eyes, stood up and started running home with Maxi. My dad healed the injury on the chicken's leg, and after a week, Poliana was fine again. I will never be tired of telling this story. A chicken told me that his friend's chicken needed help. It sounds crazy, but I will never forget how Maxi was all stressed out looking at me and chicken shouting telling me that Polly needed help and made me follow her. Amazing. Case file number 1346, written by Ooh. Time lost, anxiety gone. In my early 20s, I had a lot going on in my life. I had left school, had started a new career, was engaged to my high school sweetheart, and my anxiety was building up. This was in the mid 80s and I wore a watch. It was a gold Timex analog watch that my father gave to me. I always set the watch on my bedside table before going to sleep. I was becoming very anxious about deadlines and I found myself constantly checking my watch to make sure I didn't fall behind with anything. One morning I woke up and reached to my bedside table and my watch was missing. I checked around my table. I crawled over the edge on the bed and looked upside down under the bed. No watch. I got up and looked around the base of the bedside table. No watch. I showered, got dressed, checked my yesterday's clothes pockets. No watch. I checked in other parts of the house. No watch. I asked my fiance if she had seen it. She had not. And to this day, I know she was telling the truth. The strange thing is that this morning was the morning of my first day feeling like all the anxiety was lifted from me. I felt 100% better about everything and my stress levels were even better than they had ever been before. I never ever found the watch and I've never worn one since. Case file number 1347 written by Dinkin Flicka, The Quantum Tomato. So about two years ago now, I was going out doing errands with my mom, pretty normal. We stopped at a fruit and veggie market and were doing some shopping when we stopped at the tomatoes. I noticed a particularly large and deformed tomato, so naturally, I pick it up for further inspection. I turn this tomato around and underneath is this really gross looking rotten spot. It's all green and mushy. I put it back down and we pay and leave. Now this is where it gets really weird. We make a last stop at the grocery store before going home for some other items. And while walking through the produce section, I notice in the pile of tomatoes an eerily similar looking one to the monster I'd picked up at the market. I had this super odd feeling come over me, almost like deja vu. I picked up this new tomato and I swear to you it was the exact same. Same tomato. Same large size and deformity and the gross rotten underbelly. My mom thought I was insane and brushed it off because I was freaking out about this interdimensional tomato. This sounds so stupid as I'm typing it out but I swear I picked up the same tomato in two different places within the span of an hour. Bonus file written by Izki117. The War Memorial Mystery 
Several months ago, I had finally passed my motorcycle test and had taken to riding everywhere in my city. At the time, I was on my little 250 Ninja and found that one of my favorite routes was riding from the hills into the city and through Kings Park in Perth. Nothing seemed out of place and the night was warm. Kings Park has winding roads everywhere and lots of war memorials. It's not lit by lights in most areas, so it becomes pitch black. As I was riding through a dark area around 12ish at night, I turned on my high beams. It's about 40 kilometers an hour through the park. As I rounded a bend, I noticed a man standing against a tree. Since I didn't want to blind the poor bastard, I turned my high beams down. In that split second of doing that, the dude disappeared. I had to do a double take. Was I imagining that crap? I stopped my bike and looked over. Nobody was there. No bark on the tree to show a silhouette of a man. No bush close by too. I noped out of there quickly as. What I find most bizarre about the experience is that at the base of these trees, there is a small plaque that commemorates the life of a fallen soldier in the war. Had I seen the spirit of that fallen soldier? I don't really believe in ghosts, but I'll stand by what I saw, and I certainly don't take late rides through King's Park alone anymore. Case file number 1348, written by Aubrey Law. My quiche mutated before my eyes. Last weekend, my family and I stayed in a house at the coast to celebrate my mother's 70th birthday. We arrived Friday evening and decided to go out to breakfast Saturday morning. The restaurant we chose was a Grateful Dead themed restaurant called Grateful Bread. My husband and I have been there a few times and loved their delicious menu. Since we were a party of seven, we were split up between two different tables. I sat at a table with my husband and father while my son, mother, sister and her boyfriend sat at another. My husband and I sat facing the bakery counter and whiteboard with the daily specials written on it. Written on the board was the quiche of the day which was a spinach, ham, broccoli and cheddar quiche. It sounded great so I ordered it. When the quiche arrived, the top was completely covered in a layer of cheddar. It was delicious. Nice chunks of ham and large, steamy broccoli bits. As I was eating, my husband said casually, Looks like you got the last piece of quiche. I looked up to see the waitress erasing the quiche from the whiteboard. She then wrote in another quiche which was a mushroom, onion and zucchini option. I told my husband I was happy that we came early enough because I wouldn't have ordered that one. I don't like mushrooms or zucchini. I go back to eating and as I load up my fork, I realize there is no longer cheese on the top of my slice and my quiche is filled with mushrooms and zucchini? What just happened? I asked my husband, showing him my food. He was dumbfounded. My husband is the type of guy you see in horror movies that is always trying to convince his wife that the obviously haunted house is just old and creaky. He is very practical and even he claimed this must be a glitch. When I showed my dad, he just made a joke about the Grateful Dead. When we left the restaurant and I told the rest of the family, they tried to explain it away. My sister said the quiche must have been half and half. The only problem with that logic is the way the food was split up. Mushrooms in the back, broccoli in the front of the slice? And what happened to the cheese? Maybe I'm overthinking it, but it was extremely strange. What do you think? Case file number 1349, written by Midas Artflower. The flight missed. The affair revealed. Betrayal unveiled. Many years ago, I was going on a week-long business trip. I had begun to suspect that my boyfriend at the time wasn't faithful and, as a result, felt apprehensive about being gone that long. The morning I was returning home, the room phone rang and it was him. This was odd because our routine was to call each other in the evening, so I was immediately on guard. Then I realized he wasn't calling from his place because the background sounds weren't right, if that makes sense. I confronted him and he admitted he'd been out the night before, had overindulged, allowed himself to be taken home with someone, wasn't sure of her name, had no idea where he was or where his car was for that matter. Ugh. In his diminished state, I got him to admit he'd been unfaithful with someone else as well and told him this was the end for us and good luck finding your car. Due to my state of upset, when I looked at the return ticket again, I confused the flight number and the departure time and missed my flight. 
The nice lady at the airline counter could tell I wasn't having my best day and was very accommodating, but there was going to be a considerable wait for the next flight. I was sitting around fuming and waiting, when a porter walked past an enormous box on a flatbed. The return address label was also quite large and bore the name Magda, and the country of origin was Belarus, and I immediately knew he was having an affair with a woman by that name from that country. Names made up, but that exotic and that far from our home? Sure enough, when I saw him collecting my things, I hit him with this information and thought he was going to pass out. He got so pale. Case file number 1350, written by MiG-2900, The Adirondack Aliens. Summer 2003, Northern Adirondack Mountains near Saranac Lake, around 7 p.m. Myself and a group of friends witnessed a very strange object in the sky. The object was dark matte black color and triangular shape. The object was roughly 75 to 100 feet across, flying very slowly over a lake and about 30 feet above the trees. The object made absolutely no sound. It did not have any visible markings or lights. It slowly flew from one mountaintop over a lake, then over another mountaintop, a distance of around 3 miles. Once it reached that mountaintop, it was out of our line of sight. This event lasted around 15 to 20 minutes. All of us experienced a sense of dread, unable to do anything except to stand and stare at this thing. I wanted to run, get in the truck and get the hell out of there, but my body and mind froze in fear, and time seemed to slow down like you would experience in an adrenaline rush, injury, car accident, fight, etc. Discussing the event many times with my friends, we all remember the exact details about the object, compare sketches of the event with each other, and all experience the frozen in fear effect. We were not under the influence of drugs or alcohol. At the time, we were all around the age of 20. Seven males, three females, and two dogs. As far as I can tell, the dogs were unaware or unaffected. I believe we witnessed an alien craft not of this earth. Possibly an extra-dimensional object with mind-altering properties. On number 1351, written by Throwaway 23338-3736. I spoke a language I never learned. The day it happened, nothing was out of the ordinary or different. I went to my 9 to 5 job like any other day, and it wasn't until I got to the grocery store after work when things got strange. I went to my local grocery store, but it felt off. I usually see the same people, but that day was different. I saw people I've never seen before, and even the workers were some I've never seen. When I was picking out items, some seemed to be in another language, but I assumed it was a brand change. Then I went to the checkout, and the woman cashier started to speak to me. Whatever she was speaking, it was not English or Spanish, the only two languages I know. I started to speak to tell her I didn't understand but I started talking back to her in that language. It honestly felt like I was looking at a situation from outside my body, like I was just a soul inside and the body was talking for me. We carried on a conversation for about 5 minutes until I was all checked out. When I walked back to my car, I sat there for a solid 10 minutes before driving off. I told my partner who I lived with at the time and they told me to stay away from the internet and they laughed at me. I went back to that store two days later and I saw people I knew. The workers were the ones I knew. The brands had their regular names on it. This happened a little over a year ago and that memory still haunts me every day. Some people say it was probably a dream that I felt like was real life, but I know what I saw and felt. That was not a dream. No one believes me no matter how many details I give. Case fall number 1352, written by Lady Pennyface. The Upside Down Photo Frame Mystery. I had this heavy, ornate, hand-blown glass picture frame that sat on my dresser in my bedroom, with a picture of me and my mom in it. I was home alone, and had been in my room most of the day sorting laundry and cleaning up. At one point, I was bringing a load of laundry back into my room, and I noticed the frame was face down on my dresser, which I thought was strange because I didn't hear it fall or anything, and as I said, it was a pretty heavy glass frame. So I go over to pick it up, and in doing so, I see the picture inside the frame is now completely upside down. The picture frame obviously only stands one way. It's not like I picked it up wrong, or I don't know. 
I went through so many scenarios in a matter of seconds in utter confusion, but nothing made sense. I had chills down my spine. It just wasn't possible. Somehow the frame had been taken apart and the picture had been taken out and turned upside down and placed back in? No shot. I was completely alone. I panicked and just put it back down and left immediately to my dad's house and refused to go back until my mom got home. Case file number 1353, written by Ripe Millen, who was the mystery man who saved my life. I used to have this recurring dream, which would end with me crossing the road in front of my school and getting hit by a red truck and dying every time. It made me feel paranoid about crossing that road at times, but I used to brush it off as it's just a dream. One day when I was crossing the road while on my phone, an old man pulled me back and said, you were warned so many times and you still are careless. I looked up and saw the exact same red truck passing in front of me. I asked him who he was and he said, I'm your friend. I shook his hand and thanked him for saving me and asked him if he knew me. He replied, I'm in a hurry. Listen, I'll meet you here tomorrow. Have a good day, friend. I never saw him again. I cursed at myself for not asking him and convincing him to wait and talk to me because I had so many questions. I really hope to see him again one day. Case file number 1354, written by Half Eaten Waffle. When the future whispers to me. I get snippets of conversation or memories that come to me and don't happen until years later, and sometimes leaves me with chills. Sometimes the memories come to pass multiple times the exact same way over several years, and sometimes they continue past where the original memories end. This one time, I was sick and I was in a semi-hallucinating state, and I had an insight to a memory of a feeling of being watched in some woods under really bright moonlight. There were little bits of sentences jumbled in too, and I thought it was just a weird experience. Earlier this year, I started to recognize an increasingly frequent number of those words and sentences appearing in my day-to-day -day life, abruptly stopping around the beginning of March. In the first few weeks of March, I had a training hike for an upcoming trip to Philmont, one of BSA's high adventure sites, and the weird moonlit scene came to pass. The temperature got really cold, like from 60 degrees down to 15, and it was really still, and my breath kept fogging up. All this was taught by feeling that there was something just outside my vision watching me, and I didn't sleep more than an hour or so that night. At one point in the night, some large branch or something fell down, close enough to feel it through the ground, but in the morning there was no fresh branch. Also, I woke up in the night to deep rhythmic thuds like huge footsteps and a sound like heavy breathing outside my tent. In the morning, several of my hiking buddies said that they also noticed the thudding, there was no sign of anything ever happening. Written by Kitty Fall Down, the radio mystery that left us speechless. I'm sure this has happened to people before, but this one happens twice in a row and just made the wife and I freeze and stare blankly for a few minutes. So we often play a game in the car where we go random on the satellite radio and sing a song before it switches and randomly try to guess the artist and song. Just a stupid game that's completely random. She switched the radio station, and I'm in half the verse of a band called Submerse's Song Hollow. The station changes, and it's right bang on, word for word, exactly the same place I'm singing in the song. We both just look at each other and are like, what the hell? <laughs> I mean exactly the same mod point in the song. As we are kind of laughing about it, I start singing Vitamin C's, I Know What Boys Like, as a joke. The station switches, and freaking bang right dead on, in the exact part of the verse, dead on word for word again. Like seriously, what the hell are the odds of this crap, especially with kind of obscure songs? Let alone them being in identical parts of the songs, and word for word. We just kinda looked forward and didn't say frick all for a while. My kid was in the back and kept asking if we're okay. It most definitely gave me a serious weird feeling I've never had before. Bonus file. Written by Sim Sima 76 My Cat and Daughter's Incredible Reincarnation Saga This is going to be a bit long and I tried to summarize, but I can't make it shorter without losing the message. 
I want to preface by saying that, for the most part, I was not completely convinced we could reincarnate because I had what I thought was a near-death experience once, and I personally didn't see any white light, I just went into absolute blackness. But that could have been because I was unconscious, not actually dead. What I'm trying to say is, I was not completely convinced in reincarnation up until this happened to me. My cat died last October. He was 19 years old, and he died of congestive heart failure. It was a devastating loss for me. I saw him as my son, especially after living with him for 20 years. I kept hoping and praying he would come to me in dreams, and for a whole year he didn't. About three weeks ago, I finally had a dream where I saw my old cat, and I told him that I loved him and I hugged him and we were hanging out like we used to. When I wake up, I'm all happy and I go to tell my daughter that I had a dream with my cat. Not even 30 minutes later, this little black cat, about 6 months old, shows up at my back porch. And of course, I knew this was not my cat, at least not then. The minute I let the cat into my house, he went straight for my bed, where he used to hang out. And he sat in the exact same place where he used to sit when he was younger. I can't explain it, except there's little things that he does, like looking for the litter box exactly where the litter box used to be. He also doesn't want to go to where his old body lays. Every time he walks around that area, he kind of runs away from it. He has the same habits as an older cat and understands so much more than a normal kitten. He's also really chill and calm, the same way that my old cat was, which is bizarre for a kitten his age. I know it could just be me projecting onto this little kitten and I'm trying not to do that, but he keeps doing things that are really weird. He even answers to his old name, but right now I just call him Kitty for the most part, so I get it. But I'm not crazy. I'm fully aware of what I'm saying. I'm not in denial. I was fully at peace with the fact that my cat had passed away. I don't really have any more evidence than what I've stated. But he's not the only one that I think has reincarnated. When my daughter was four years old, she told me that I kept calling her name. And I said, what are you talking about? I was not calling your name but my daughter's name is my grandmother's name. I knew this when I told her that, but I was trying to see what she would say, and she insisted that yes, I was calling her name and that's why she came. She said she was supposed to go to another planet, but instead, she came here to be with me. My teenage daughter has no recollection of ever saying this, but I wrote it down so I would never forget. When I asked her what that place was, she told me one thing which puts chills down my spine. The name Lavinia. I'd never heard that name come out of anybody's mouth before. The only time I'd ever heard that name was in a book with a ship named the USS Lavinia. I found the name so entrancing that all I remember about the book is that ship's name. I can't even find the book again. I've looked everywhere. It's almost as if it never existed. I read it one summer when I was 10 years old. So imagine me at 36 years old hearing my 4 year old tell me that one name that had haunted me had never been heard in 26 years. Nobody today has named that, it's a name from the 1800s. And to me that was a sign, because I knew that name was special to me, but I didn't know why. And apparently, Lavinia was the caretaker when she was in that other world. She called it the world of a lot of light. So no doubt that Lavinia is something of mine too, and that I will also see her when I pass. One last thing before this becomes an epic novel. If you're hurting because somebody that you lost has gone away, just know that there may be a way for them to come back. It won't be exactly the same, but there will be things that will let you know that it's them. I'm so happy now that my loved ones are back. It's been a beautiful experience and I hope the same for anyone reading this. Big cyber hug from me. Case file number 1356, written by Urban Bong. My old radio had a will of its own. I grew up in a small town in Georgia, kind of out in the woods. My grandfather had purchased land out there, but later moved to some suburbs and left the land to his kids. My uncle got the original house, close to the road. My aunt graveled the driveway quite a ways further into the property and lived in a trailer there. When I was six, we moved from Tennessee and my parents built their dream home on my dad's share of the property, sharing my aunt's driveway, but diverting right before her trailer and going even further onto the land. So we were pretty far away from the main road. 
They built a single story home, but it was kind of like on a half hill and had a basement. So there was a back door that led into one of the rooms in the basement, but the rest of it was underground. They always planned on turning the basement into a bottom story, but it really never got finished. Only the right half rooms really had drywall up, and the two left rooms were never drywalled. My dad used it as a workshop area. My dad developed epilepsy and lost his job, but he was doing landscape type work for his morbidly obese hoarder woman. The woman got evicted from her home, and our unfinished basement, which was already full of old stuff my parents had gotten over the years, became filled with a bunch of her hoarder stuff because she was paying us to keep it, I guess. All of these things were stored in the large room that the back door opened into. I'm somewhere around the age of 12 when this happened. My parents had taken my sister out shopping or something, I think. But the main thing is, I was home alone. I was upstairs watching TV and got up to use the bathroom. I'm in the hallway and I hear music coming from somewhere. I finally trace the music coming from a vent down close to the floor. 12 years old me knows the ventilation ducking is on the roof of the basement, so I decided to go on an adventure and put a stop to this music. The basement access is right after you go through the front door of the house. Looks almost like a closet, but if you open it, there is a stairwell that leads down and then cuts a 90 degree angle left and continues down. So when you're standing at the top, you can pretty much only see stairs and walls and no basement. I always hated it and it creeped me out and that stairwell usually had the only working light. And because you went underground, the basement was always way colder than upstairs. I slowly walked down the lit stairwell into the darkness. When you reach the bottom, it opens up onto the left side basement rooms that were unfinished and where my dad's workshop is. I peeked around the edge of the stairwell and looked down the hallway into the more finished areas. While I'm doing that, I tried to turn on the lights because the light switch is right there at the stairwell. Click click. No light. But coming from the big room with all the hoarder stuff in it, there's a green glowing light. I can't not check it out, I have to know. So I go into the darkness with my heart pounding. I make it to the access way of the room and stand there for a second or two, getting my bearings and trying to figure out where the light is coming from. In the very middle of the room, there's a path cutting through all the junk in there, leading to the back door. And right next to the back door, sitting on some old dressers, is a really old, really big stereo system my dad had picked up. It was playing on some radio station or something, with the little green screen causing some weird green glow. I ran in and grabbed the plug and unplugged it really quick, because I didn't want to make the time for the creepy darkness to try to figure out which button turned it off. I tested the back door real quick, which was always locked, to make sure it was still locked. Then they take off like a demon is right behind me, towards the light of the stairwell, and zip back up the stairs and slam and lock the door to the basement. Take a breath, and laugh at myself for being silly, go back to watching TV. After a little bit, I decided to go back to my room and get a book I was really interested in. Crossing through the hallway, I heard a sound that made my hair stand up and my eyes actually started to tear up. I still have zero explanation for it to this day. But there was the music again, drifting up through the vents. I took off running out the front door, ran all the way up the driveway to my uncle's house and refused to leave until I heard my parents driving down the gravel, returning home. When we got home, I made my dad come and check it out with me. Sure enough, the radio was plugged in again. My dad said maybe I had grabbed on one of the other plugs that was laying down near the outlet, but I remember the radio had been the only thing plugged in when I grabbed it. He also said it was probably an electrical issue in the radio that made it turn on since it was so old. But frick that property and frick that house. I played in the woods all the time and would find old Native American arrowheads. If you climbed through a barbed wire fence and went onto the neighbor's land, there was the foundation from burnt out settler home from the 1800s with three graves on it. All of my family members had stories about seeing weird stuff in the woods. Both of my parents died in that house, and one of the tenants that rented it after I went to live with my grandparents said they saw my mom. I don't believe in ghost stories and think people make most of that stuff up, including the seeing my mom thing and a lot of the stuff my family saw in the woods. But I know I freaking heard that music, and I know I unplugged that radio. Case file number 1357, written by Don't Define Me Butthole, the day I saw blood in the mirror.
One time, I was at a super old but also very high-end restaurant in my hometown. There have always been rumors the place was haunted, as the building is over a hundred years old and it's been known to have a few ghost sightings. I went to use the restroom, but the whole time I was there, it felt like I was being watched. I went to wash my hands, looked in the mirror, nothing weird. Looked at my hands and saw blood everywhere, all over my hands, all over the sink, it was on my clothes, it was everywhere. I looked up in the mirror really fast and looked back at my hands. Totally normal, clean hands, nothing weird at all. Case file number 1358, written by Infected Needle. My entire reality was shattered on K10. When my friend and I were in high school, we saw a massive, flying, unidentifiable object. I can't even think about it without my eyes watering because it hits a deep, deep existential fear of the unknown in me. So here's the story as I write while blinking away tears. We were driving on K10 to Topeka late on a clear night with a bright moon. Car trips are uneventful, hardly anyone on the highway as it's like 1am. Anyways, at some point during the drive, I looked to my right out the passenger window and about 300 meters off the highway above the tree line next to the highway floating maybe 100 meters off the ground is a massive black triangle. It looked like three approximately 60 foot beams or poles connected to form a triangle. Inlaid in the triangle were flashing lights of different colors, red, green, yellow, white, etc. I told my friend to look. I was terrified. When your reality very clearly and objectively does not fit what reality is supposed to be, for me at least, cause some kind of dread I can't even explain. The entire time we drove past it, it stayed exactly in one spot, hovering, making no noise, but there was something about it that made me feel like some part of it held an intellect akin to our own. I was too scared to record it even though my friend driving urged me to. When I told him I didn't want to film it because I didn't want to interact with it if that makes sense. Potentially earning the ire of some freaking unknown alien or extra dimensional intelligence that clearly hides itself? Frick that. Eventually it was no longer visible behind the trees and I breathed a sigh of relief it didn't follow us. I regret not recording it immensely. Case file number 1359, written by Occam's Broadsword. I knew my family was in danger. When I was about seven, my older brother and my dad were leaving to drive from our home down to our grandparents about 600 miles away. I remember them preparing for the trip and packing the pickup. About half an hour before they left, I got really upset and had this overwhelming sense that they were going to crash on the trip. I told them not to go and that they were going to crash. I told them this several times and started full on crying about it. Eventually, my mom calmed me down with some ice cream and they left. About 400 miles into the trip, a pickup and trailer pulled out in front of them and to avoid crashing, my dad had to go into the ditch. Everyone made it out okay, thankfully and with minimal damage. Everyone in my family makes that same drive several times a year. We drive a lot as a family. I've never been in a car wreck. Nobody in my family has been in a car wreck. I have never been upset when my dad or older brother left on trips before, nor have I since. I was always a mama's boy, <laughs> but that day I just knew something bad was going to happen and it turned out to be sort of right. Can't explain it. Case file number 1360, written by Anonymous. The Onslaught of Glitches The big story that scares both of us is one day, my wife and I were desperately trying to find our window AC unit's remote control to make the living room cooler. We were both searching and decided to check under the couch together. Right as I was about to turn on the flashlight on my phone, a friend called and I picked it up and he said he was outside, so I immediately left the apartment to go downstairs and say hey. The creepy part is that my wife swears upon the stars that instead of me getting that phone call when I did in my reality, in hers, I turned the flashlight on, looked under the couch with her and we found it together and celebrated. Then my friend called and I went outside. When I, the real me, came back in, I saw the air was running so I asked her where the controller was. She gave me an annoyed look and was like, what do you mean where was it? You're the one that helped me find it just now a few minutes ago. I'm sure I probably went completely white as I explained to her that no, I received that phone call sooner than she is claiming and was outside with my friend the entire time. I even showed her the call log timestamp 
She's the one that went white and she swears on her freaking life that I helped her find the remote and didn't go outside or get the phone call until after we celebrated finding it. We were both so creeped out and confused that we had to stop talking about it. It was making both our hair stand on ends and getting goosebumps and felt like we were losing our minds or something. We are both adamant that the reality we individually experienced is the real one. So neither of us know who that person was that looked and acted just like me while I was actually outside the entire time. Definitely some sort of scary glitch. After that, we each had a handful of other terrifying glitches happen to us both, separately and together not long after this experience, but they stopped after a few days. It was like we messed up the programming or due to that one glitches caused like a butterfly effect of more glitches until the universe settled back into where everything should be for everyone. Case file number 1361, written by Renjen B, the cryptic, time-bending lady. One time, when I was a freshman in college, I went to my first class of the day a few minutes early. I had maybe 10 minutes until class began, but there was another class in the auditorium so I decided to wait outside the doors on one of the benches. As I walked up, I double checked the time on a clock hanging outside the auditorium, then made my way to a bench that only had one other person on it. She watched me approach, and even when I sat down, she continued to stare at me. I looked at her and kind of laughed awkwardly, then pulled something to read out of my backpack. She continued to look at me, and I felt extremely uncomfortable. She was a small, shriveled woman of 65, I'd guess. She didn't seem to have any materials for class and was dressed in thick, long clothing, even though it was late summer. Her hair was wild and gray, and she had a disturbingly sinister look on her face. She clearly didn't belong. I tried to ignore her since all the other benches were full, and I didn't have long until class began. The longer she stared at me, the more I began to feel a sleepy or woozy confusion come over me. It felt like people were screaming in my ears, but the only sounds were people talking quietly and shuffling papers as they waited for the next class session. She continued to stare, and I felt more and more disoriented and sluggish. It was like being drugged while also having a psychotic break all in a few minutes. At one point, I even felt sick to my stomach because I felt so off. At the end of the 10 minutes, the bells rang, announcing the top of the hour, the beginning of my class. I gathered my things, stood up, and entered the auditorium. All the while, the woman continued to watch me, never saying a word. I sat down in class and heard someone call my name. Did you just add this class? I haven't seen you before. It was one of my neighbor friends. I smiled and laughed and told her I'd been in the class all semester. We just must have missed each other. It was a decently small class, less than a hundred people, so it was weird that we hadn't noticed each other before, but it didn't seem too out of the norm. Suddenly the professor walked in and I realized I had never seen her before in my life. I made a sheepish face at my friend and told her, oops, just kidding, must have gone in the wrong door. I grabbed my stuff and walked out into the hall only to discover, one, I hadn't gone in the wrong classroom at all, I was exactly where I intended to be. Two. The creepy woman was no longer there, and neither was the bench. 3. It was in fact, two hours later than when I arrived. I had already missed my human development class, as well as my anatomy lecture, and I was now late for chemistry, which was on the other side of campus. I looked at my watch as well as the clock I had looked at before when I arrived. Both were functioning and both told me the same thing, I was late for chemistry. I looked around me, trying to see what could have happened. I hadn't fallen asleep, I hadn't misread the hour when I first arrived, I hadn't been sitting there for more than 10 minutes, yet somehow, hours had passed, all while a mysterious and creepy woman stared unblinkingly at me. To this day, I still have no idea what happened. I know for a fact that I arrived at the time I thought I did. I specifically checked the university's clock upon arrival. I know for a fact that I didn't fall asleep, didn't have a stroke, seizure, or other fit, I know that my perception of time was unbroken and that it totaled less than 10 minutes. I know the woman didn't break eye contact with me from the moment I stepped into the building until I stepped into the auditorium for my class. But I don't know how I managed to sit through two classes while side-eyeing the woman who was watching me. 
The only solution I can come up with is that she was a witch who decided to cast a spell on me for unknown reasons, or I got lost in the space-time continuum. Either way, I have no idea what happened. Bonus file written by Anonymous. A ball of light and the miracle in the dark. When I was about five or six, I got up in the night to use the bathroom. I walked down the hall and noticed the light was on in there. So I had to pee, wash my hands, and I kind of messed around in the cabinet mirror for a minute or so. When I went to leave the bathroom, I pulled the light cord and nothing happened. The room stayed totally bright. I pulled the cord again and what I can only describe as a ball of light floated out of the room and down the hall. Everything around it lighting up as if it were daytime. It went into my room and floated above my bed. I stood in my doorway, kind of freaked out. It then floated over my shoulder and into my parents' room. As I walked in, it was kind of hovering above my sleeping mother. It stayed above her for probably a few seconds before fading into complete darkness. I was kind of paralyzed with fear, and I was just standing in the black room. My mother woke up and kind of gasped at me, froze on the spot. She took me back to bed as I was explaining what I saw, and she was comforting me and saying it was a dream, etc. A few weeks later, she found out she was pregnant, and I to this day believe it was a sign or something. The reason I say this is because a few years earlier, she had lost a child, my younger brother. He unfortunately died during childbirth, and she was told that she wouldn't be able to have children again due to complications brought on by the birth. I can recall every detail about that night, like it was yesterday, and I'm approaching my 30s now. I was very much awake and lucid, but still cannot explain any of what I saw that night. Case file number 1362, written by Parkity Park Park. The strange tale of the man made out of wood. This is a more mild one. But when I was like five, I had this mysterious recurring nightmare of what I called the man made out of wood. Imagine a scarier looking version of the stick bug from a bug's life, but with two heads. I always knew he was coming because someone would throw up or we would find vomit on the ground somewhere and right after he would show up, nab me and take off and the dream would end. No clue where these dreams came from. I actually quite liked the stick bug guy and nothing had happened to cause these very specific recurring nightmares. After a while, I overcame the fear in the nightmare and never had another appearance again. Fast forward to last year around Halloween. I was on a mission for my church and I forgot why, but I told my companion that story and we talked about how odd and mysterious it was. That evening, we had dinner with an older European couple in our church one night. When we walk in, they have a full-size figure hanging from the ceiling in their entryway that was a spitting image of the man made out of wood. Case file number 1363, my glasses pulled a Houdini act. This actually just happened. I was cleaning up my desk and I accidentally moved a few books to the side where I'd put my glasses earlier. I thought to myself, oh crap, when I noticed that it was already late. They fell to the right side of my desk and I even heard the noise of them falling to the ground. I got distracted for a second. When I went to pick them up, they were gone. There were a few cables on that side of the desk, so at first I thought they had gotten stuck and I just couldn't see it but I untangled all of them and still no traces of the glasses. I've looked everywhere, even found old items that had gotten stuck in a small place near the desk, but the glasses are absolutely nowhere to be found. I checked in the weirdest places possible, including my shoes because what if? Right now I'm just kind of anxious because I really need them and I kind of get headaches if I don't wear them for too long while at school. Maybe I'm just sleepy and need to get back to it tomorrow or I put them somewhere else, but I don't remember it. Either way, this is so weird and I feel like I'm about to go crazy. Case file number 1364, written by Jane Remifa Soladito, the glowing pink bag that defied reality. This happened at summer at a barbecue I had with some of the neighbors on our street. Typical hot dog, hamburgers, potato salad. I had made a comment to my next door neighbors about how I should have made green salad, but the heat wouldn't permit. This is important to remember later. The afternoon carried on as normal, but when the sun started to set, I suggested we get a game of cornhole going. 
I have a board that I painted myself that glows in the dark with LED lights around the board and have bags that also glow 4 pink, 4 green. We paired up and separated the bags, 4 green and 4 pink. After 3 rounds, the other team is up by 3 points and it's now my turn. I throw my first bag, pink, and boom it sinks perfectly into the hole you could see the pink illuminate through the hole clear as day. Other teams let out the typical ugh sound. My partner and I cheer our neighbors who were just watching all cheer. We continued on taking turns throwing our bags until the match ends. As the other side starts to collect the bags, I see them both look around for my pink bag that I made directly a hole in one. They can't find it anywhere. There are no kids or pets to blame and I thought maybe the other person was jokingly hiding the bag? They both tell me they hadn't touched it and look equally confused. Now all of us spend the next 20 minutes searching my tiny backyard, dumping the trash can out, looking in the neighbor's yard for the bag, but to no avail. The bag was never found. So we called the game and figured we would find it later. We all kind of exchange that strange faces with each other, because if you ever played cornhole, you know when a bag sinks into the hole, there isn't really any other place else it could go, and besides under the board, but whatever. I brushed it off and started to tidy up a bit, clearing plates and empty cups, when I noticed the table with all the food on it, and right in the center is a freaking salad? Did someone come late and bring the salad? I'm just standing there when I notice not only is there a salad, but it's in one of my salad bowls? I am floored. I don't want to sound crazy, so I casually asked each neighbor if it was them that brought the salad. They all said no. The neighbor had made the comment about making us a salad, but knowing it wouldn't be good in this weather remembered me saying that and seeing that bowl, but never paid attention to what was in it. As the night ended, and I'm cleaning up the rest of the mess, I decided to look again for the bag and never find it. My friend is inside washing dishes and asks me whose salad bowl did this belong to. I had figured maybe I did make a salad and forgot, so the bowl was mine? Except when they put it away, my exact same bowl was already in the cabinet? I just stood there stunned. How could that be? They even had the same tiny piece of the price sticker on the bottom of the bowl that no matter how hard I scrubbed I couldn't get it off, and that clear sticky part remained. I'm a logical thinker, I truly believe everything can be explained away somehow or some way. So I still tell myself that to this day, this has to be the case, because maybe the bag got picked up on accident, maybe I had two bowls identical, maybe I just forgot. But no one claimed the bowl or found the bag, so it will always leave a little doubt in my mind of what really happened that day. Okay, sounds file 1327. The Island of Inexplicable Silence. I don't recommend pressing your luck with a return visit. There are areas of the world that are more in flux than others. I think this is one of those areas. We're entering it. You're covered by a kind of metaphysical shield that doesn't enable the outside world to permeate through. It's not a physical barrier. And who knows if this kind of thing is even stable. I wouldn't test it. There are a lot of daredevils out there, and I guess through them we might learn more information. So there's that. Okay, so for the bonus file. Two-tone and the unknown. Important to point out here that this could have been planned out by the group nevertheless if both the old woman and the young chap were in on it. I don't typically make assumptions about fakery like that, but I also don't think it's wise to discount it entirely, because some people do that. I mean, especially when money is involved. You have to be suspect of that. For me reading this, the lack of a cold spell, or any sort of electrical distortion either, further indicates trickery by the paranormal tour guides, or points to another possibility, maybe that spirits can only cause distortions either through intentionally willing it, or if they're draining energy from the surrounding area. If the latter, my guess is it's like a battery. Eventually they're all topped up and don't need any more. Maybe that's the case here. This young chap was fully charged. And now time for the quote of the day. Holding onto anger is like grasping onto hot coal with the intent of throwing it at someone else. You are the one who gets burned. Buddha. And you know, maybe the person you throw it at also gets burned. But is it worth it? You're getting burned, they get burned, maybe you burn the house down too. Just try not to fight fire with fire. Maybe sometimes it's unavoidable, but I think tamping down those instincts is a better, wiser course of action over the course of a lifetime. If you let anger fester, it's just going to cause havoc for everyone else. And for many people that you love, that you don't intend to get harmed, they're going to 
they're going to get caught in the crossfire. Never a good thing. In fact, if you have anger, the best thing to do is just move away from whatever is causing you that anger. Go do something else. You move somewhere else if you have to. Sometimes it's the best course of action. Quesantifa, 1328. The day the sky shattered with the Columbia disaster. I do wonder how far this kind of explosive force could be felt, even hours away east. I'm not sure if this was a glitch per se, if you felt the reverberation beyond what should be intended. Just a terribly sad disaster, though, in our quest to command the final frontier. I think there sadly will be more to come. But that's the nature of exploration, of pushing our boundaries. But even if it's not always safe, it's always worth doing. To those brave souls that gave their life in pushing the boundaries, may you all rest in peace. You deserve it. Case notes for the creepy file number 129, Red Lights in the Park. It's those little choices that can lead us to terrible and dangerous places. Ignoring your gut, the entire atmosphere of an area, and even your own dog's warnings. Well, it's a great thing that nothing happened in the end. Some people can be so creepy it boggles the mind. It's not the supernatural we have to fear. It's mankind. Sometimes. Not everyone. But when we do want to be feared, we can be truly terrifying. Okay, so it's for the bonus file. The Shared Sense of Dread. I think it's possible for spirits to induce visions into people nearby, into their minds. That's what happened here. It's impossible otherwise for two people to hallucinate the exact same vision at exactly the same time. I don't buy that. Something had to have induced it, and the most logical sense is the spirits that still occupy, that are still imprinted in that home. And now time for the quote of the day. I am not afraid of storms, for I am learning how to sail my ship. Louisa May Alcott. That's the whole story of life. Life is sailing a ship on open waters, on a horizon you have no idea what's on the other side of. You don't really get to decide what ship you have. You might have a rickety old little sailing ship. <laughs> That's it. And other people might be born on a frickin' cruise ship. Other people might be born on a cruise ship that turns out to be the Titanic. So, don't judge other people on their situation or bemoan life because it's unfair. It might be, and in some cases, it'll be unfair for different reasons than you might expect. All you can do, and I actually hearken back to a quote from Gandalf, is to decide what to do with the time you're given, and the situations you're presented with, because we don't control those things. We only control our own mind, our own actions, to some degree our thoughts, and more importantly, what we do with our thoughts, and with our time. How are you going to use your time today? Let me know in the comments. Okay, so it's for file 1329. Did I see my future self on the tram? You're not crazy, but I also don't think this was your future self. I think this was a deliberate alignment by your guardian angel that wanted you to have a glimpse of the whereabouts your current life trajectory would take you on by navigating you closer to someone that was very similar to you, but not you. I think this is important for all of us, to have a glimpse at that domino path that we're on right now, where is it going to lead? We can always divert it. It's like we're on a train with a, where we're the conductor that can alter the track we're on. But if you don't know where the track leads, it's very hard to make an informed decision. So I think guardian angels sometimes try to inform us. Subtly. And sometimes not so subtle, as in this case. Okay, so notes from file 1330. The mysterious slapping boards. It's a very odd indeed and eerie. Some kind of intelligent animal banging on flat branches together? I don't think it's Bigfoot exactly, but then who really knows what's out there? If you go camping, go prepared with items to defend yourself, because things do indeed go bump in the night, out in those deep woods. You don't want to be unprepared. Okay, so let's file 1331. The scream that stalked my soul. No one sane can knock you for being creeped out by this. Foxes make freaky mating sounds, like a scream, like a chilling scream that someone's in trouble. And that could indeed be it. A larger than typical fox population in that stretch of woods, so people report the fox mating call more often than usual. That said, is anyone going to go check? <laughs> I wouldn't. What if it's a banshee or even worse? Anyways, I'll link a video below on the mating call sounds of foxes. Really is disturbing, but it's good to know it, just in case you hear something exactly like that. You know, okay, it's not a banshee, it's just foxes. <laughs> Nature is weird. And now time for the quote of the day. Behold the turtle. He makes progress only when he sticks his neck out. James Bryan Conn. And as they also say, the turtle wins the race. Eventually.
the very, very long-term race. You do have to stick your neck out here and there, don't you? Unless you're happy with a quiet life. For better or worse, you have to ask yourself what you want from life. It really is the ultimate question. Not the meaning of life. The meaning of your life. What is it? I can tell you the meaning of my life. My life's meaning is peace. Good food. A beautiful view. A crackling fire by an open fireplace. While snow is gently falling outside. Cuddle up on the couch with a warm hot chocolate. And eventually, some kids to share it with. And of course, a loving wife. I think Dave is afraid he's going to be left out, but I'm, I'm always going to bring you along, Dave. <laughs> Case notes are file 1332, The Silent Watchers. Many people leaving the park, indicating that the shared dread may have been universal and thus very potent. The Red Moon would also add on top of the pile of signs, if you want to consider that biblical angle. That part could be a coincidence, though, as you suggest, from particulates in the atmosphere from an earlier windy day. The Canyonlands area is indeed a very dry, sandy, and red place. The silver lining to this is, while I do think there were spirits there that considered your presence to be a form of trespassing, that you both received internal warnings simultaneously, and the big one at exactly the same time and place on the trail. I think that indicates some of the spirits there were less harsh in their view, and wanted to offer an ample warning before any other action was taken against both of you. Kind of similar to if you trespass on most people's places now. They're not just going to open fire instantly. They'll give you a warning to leave most of the time. So I think most spirits would be like that too. They do consider this holy ancestral land, perhaps. But they don't just want to, uh, whatever ghosts would do, <laughs> to fire away. Now time for the quote of the day. We are what we pretend to be. So we must be careful what we pretend to be. Kurt Vonnegut. It's that other saying where you are what you do. And initially, you could say you're pretending, because you're not that good at it yet. If you put a hundred hours into something, a skill, a hobby, you'll be reasonably skilled at it. Of course, maybe not at the professional level. There's different layers and theories on how much time you have to put in to master something, like the 10,000 hours thing. And I think that's maybe true for absolute mastery. But you definitely don't need that much time to be decent and pretty good at something you know, a few hundred hours, you can improve really well, depending on your base level of talent. And to me, that's, I think, what talent is. Talent is just the base level where you start at. Like in an MMORPG where your character's skill is tracked by a specific number, like 1 to 99 in RuneScape or 1 to 300 in World of Warcraft. Those with a lot of talent, innate talent in any given field, they might start at like level 50 mining instead of 1. And you, uh, you have no talent at all. You start at level one. So you can both still get to the max level. And there's probably no difference if you both do. It just, for people without talent, it might take longer. But that doesn't really matter. If you enjoy pretending to be a carpenter or a brick mason or a orator, I mean, that's exactly what I did. I pretended to be a narrator for a long time until I eventually became one. Whatever it is you enjoy doing, even if you don't have any natural talent, that's okay. You're starting at level one. If you enjoy it, just keep at it, and eventually you'll reach the same level where other people may have, by default, been level 50, and it took you two years to reach that same level, but now you're even, and now you can progress. You know, life isn't fair, but that doesn't mean you can't out-earn the unfairness. Okay, so on to file 1333. Kevin, the crouching ghost. That a ghost might be scared that we can see them, not the other way around, is quite the twist. There's some logic to it. For the majority of your existence as a spirit, no one ever realized you're there. So, it's as if you're adorned with a persistent cloak of invisibility, and then in one instant, someone notices you. You're just watching them sleep, maybe bored, maybe interested in them for some reason, and then they notice you? When that's never happened before? I would be scared, even if I was a ghost. It would be piercing. An unforgettable moment of horror for you and Kevin, because of the unknown. Why did that happen? Case notes of the bonus file. Ghostly waves. Four foot tall and a pitter-patter sound? I believe you're playing host to a haunting of a large dog. The waving your boyfriend saw in the shadow could have been a moving paw or maybe a wagging of a ghostly tail. Indeed, via the auditory clue, I don't think this was human. Or maybe it's a human and also his pet. Maybe both of them. 
I would imagine if a pet dies, and with the owner too, just that traumatic bond could make them linger behind. Again, just a fragment of it. Now time for the quote of the day. The test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time, and still retain the ability to function. F. Scott Fitzgerald. You know, they have a word for this, cognitive dissonance. But usually it rubs people the wrong way, and I think it's why most people stick to a particular ideological tribe, because to even entertain another idea, to incorporate it into your mind, it's like installing it on the computer, but only running it in a virtual machine so it doesn't affect the main one, so you're afraid, oh, this might be a virus, like an intellectual virus. You have to be able to partition it away, still inside your mind, to consider it. If you're a capitalist and you, you still want to understand communism and vice versa, or any other possible contradictory opinion, things that don't mesh together, oil and water, you still want to be able to think about them, to contemplate them. Because if you can't, it's like the opposite of straw manning someone, it's steel manning them, to show that you understand their position. Even if you don't believe it's true, or accurate, or workable, you still want to be able to entertain other people's ideas. Because if you can't do that, well, really... You're not, you're never in a discussion with someone else. It's a battlefield. That's it. And that always ends bloody. Case Notes File 1334. The bus ride that united hearts. Who says that glitches can't create love? No one can anymore, after this story. Wow. Harkening back to the Oracle and the Matrix and the Vase, did the knowledge from the dream push you into love? Like Neo was affected by what the Oracle said. Or was he always going to break the vase no matter what? A self-fulfilling prophecy of sorts. Or was love guaranteed in this lifetime, regardless of what you saw or didn't see? I like to think of it as a former, because it gives us more wiggle room in how we structure our own future and how we apply free will to it. Because even if, in this one particular universe, the future is preordained, there's other futures, so it wouldn't negate free will exactly, but it's still... You're on this track, and you want to be able to say, yeah, I can affect the direction the train is going to go. I just find that more interesting, I guess. Okay, so it's for the bonus file. The best fried ghosts in town. Sometimes, I try to imagine the life story of ghosts I read about. For instance, the little boy looking into the oven. Did his father recruit him young to aid in the restaurant business? If it's a pizza-style oven, maybe to help create perfection pies. Thinking of it like that, you can see why some ghosts would want to linger behind, repeating their best memories. It's actually like heaven in Supernatural, where heaven is reliving your best moments, your best memories. For the spirit still here, not in trauma, but in contentness, I can understand that perspective. On occasion, this pattern they repeat can be abruptly halted by someone or something else, in which case you may hear falling objects. In that pattern, it was abruptly interrupted. It's like stopping a train. Everything on it moves with it. But it wasn't real matter. It wasn't material of this dimension. Not for a long period of time, because you might see the ghost, but eventually it'll fade away. The pattern you only see parts of. Same thing with the falling blades. And now time for the quote of the day. The human brain starts working the moment you are born, and never stops until you stand up to speak in public. George Jessup. I was thinking about this the other day, where I'm pretty comfortable speaking to an audience now of thousands of people, sometimes tens of thousands in one video, and I'm saying a lot of stuff, and yeah, I do have the ability to edit it, so if I flub a word or something, I can just push over it, no biggie. Even though I'm speaking, it's, it's like a number on a screen, it doesn't feel, and I interact with people in the comments and everything, but it doesn't feel the same as speaking to someone in real life, and especially on it the same amount of people, thousands of people in an auditorium or something, I would, it would be very difficult for me to do that. I'm not exactly nervous. I'm a pretty stoic person in general. But speaking to that many people, there's just so many minds transfixed on you in that given moment. I guess if I had something important to say and I knew what I was going to say, maybe then it wouldn't be so bad. But just like thrust in randomly, that would be terrifying. Okay, so let's file 1335. The Tale of the Snake Premonition Now imagine the amount of people who have similar dreams, premonitions of the future, but disregard them entirely. Go about their day, even when it's oh so eerily familiar, when they are in real life matching whatever they dreamed about. 
because even the notion of accepting something beyond the fully known and accepted is in of itself more terrifying to these people than having this kind of gift to them, the gift of future knowledge. It's kind of sad to think on that, but at least there are exceptions to the rule, like yourself, and I would encourage anyone else, if you ever have a premonition, take it seriously. Maybe it won't pan out, but it's better to be safe than sorry, right? Certainly the case in this story. Case notes for the bonus file. The Orchard Enigma. Freaking fricked out indeed. <laughs> I remember growing up, nothing would really scare me directly, unless I saw either my dad or teacher afraid of something too. Usually big insects or other animals. Nothing supernatural for me, but still. As a kid, you truly revere authority figures close to your life, like your parents or teachers, your pastors if you go to church. And if they're fearful of something, that emotion seeps deep into your soul, and it isn't easily removed. Processing that fear is very difficult, and fear is indeed the most primal of all emotions, so we're not always logical or able to apply logic. In this case, maybe it wasn't anything supernatural, just a weird animal that no one saw before. Or maybe it was something even from a different universe, though that can happen too. Good thing it didn't attack you. And now time for the quote of the day. If your success is not on your own terms, if it looks good to the world but does not feel good in your heart, it is not success at all. Anna Quindlin. And this is less of a quote that I will just expand on a lot. For me, I'm more curious to know, what is success to you? For me, success in my current life story is just managing this channel, growing it, and also eventually having land and literally building my own cabin with just a hem, like raw physical tools, no power tools. I always found that, I don't want to say cheating, because obviously the goal is just to build efficiently so more people can have houses, but if it's something you're doing just for yourself, I don't know. There's almost something spiritual about it, building something raw like that. And of course it'll take longer, but I wouldn't be in a rush. Maybe that's the other part of it. I don't want to feel like I'm in a rush. When you focus too much on efficiency, then Part of it is just, yeah, we got to go, 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 get this done. Like, <laughs> slow down, smell the roses, take a cup of coffee. You'll be okay. But that's just for me. So what is success to you? Let me know. Okay, so not so far, 1336. A grandfather's final gift, the guiding light. Sounds like your granddad had a solid sense of humor, making light of unfortunate situations like death, which of course we know one way or another is not the finality most people think it is. but. I mean, that's still brilliant. I mean, more for your sake than his. If I go, and some part of me lingers behind as a spirit, that's what I'd try to do. Infuse a bit of positivity, hope, humor, however I could. Wonder if your granddad was somehow able to nudge the friend of your husband's co-worker along? Maybe if it wasn't the best home for this puppy, and the confluence of events is so exceptionally unlikely on their own, that they had to be introduced as a dream, so you would accept it more readily or maybe no, it was from him. It's not wrong to want some credit for helping your your family. I can understand wanting that. Okay, so that's for the bonus file. The haunting of Nikita's martini bar. Sadness, pondering on how brutal life was deep in our past for our ancestors. Wherever you go, people were so overwhelmed. In many cases, too much so to continue. I think people often have a rosy outlook on the lives of our ancestors, but even just going back a century, daily life was brutal. So many of the spirits from that era might not be angry, but still carry that negative crushing weight with them wherever they go. Again, repeating the pattern. And in this case, it's not always a positive one. And sometimes it's more about how they went out, more than how they lived. I think we should take that knowledge, that somber note, and try to make sure our lives, the legacy of our lives, is extremely positive. That's the best thing we can do. Case notes for the bonus file, when darkness beckoned. Going much beyond being a spirit here, or a multiverse crossover, the creepy long fingers and the nails is a horror trope, but perhaps there's a good reason for that, beyond the universally accepted creepy factor. I think the roots of most of our horror stems from real-life encounters that people deep in the past, and sometimes even to this day, have. And those stories, they evolve into myths and legends, and they carry a lot of weight in how people, to this day, write horror stories or movies and so on. But that doesn't mean that those events don't really happen, to some extent. You know, the, the myth may be altered and 
it's like when you're playing that phone game as a kid, you know, where you, you have to pass a message to someone next to you and they go all the way around a circle. Eventually, when it gets, gets back to you, you might have said uh, hamburgers and they come back with beets, you know, something that doesn't fit. How, how possibly could it have uh, been so distorted? But over the generations, that can apply. And now time for the quote of the day. A bird does not sing because it has an answer. It sings because it has a song. Chinese proverb. Isn't this a beautiful way to think about life? You don't do what you do because you have an answer for the world necessarily or a solution. You just are who you are and go out in the world and be who you are. Unabashedly so is the word. If people like it, great. It doesn't, you're not there to solve the world's problems. If you do happen to, if that's your inner purpose, your song, then fantastic. People carry this weight on. And there's a great, especially these days, where we're not directly involved with the earth, with our own lives, our own survival, so we lack purpose. And so people try to MacGyver up purpose, but I don't think that works. It has to be innate to you. You have to find your song, and then you'll have your purpose. Okay, so 1337. The Enigmatic Water Filter Man. I'd say if you build a relationship with contractors, handymen of all types, I don't think it's overcharging to keep using them, even if they're expensive. You're paying for that peace of mind built up over years that they'll get the job done and done well. Hard to put a price tag on that. Could this have been the makings of a possible scam or break-in attempt? I've heard of thieves posing as service workers to get inside a house and scout it out for valuables, defenses, and so on. What isn't clear is how this man could have known you needed work done on the filter. If he somehow knew, like he had tapped your phone lines, then he'd know the name of the company your dad used, the boss and all that. So why not pretend to be working for him? Why feign ignorance? As a possible scam or whatnot, it doesn't seem to add up. So was it a multiverse event, where this was your father's guy in a different universe? If so, boy, he must have been seriously confused too. And I think a lot of glitches are like that. Everyone involved is confused. Case notes for the bonus file. From Childhood Innocence to Paranormal Mystery. I always found older technology to be fascinating. I'd play with my grandma's old rotary phone all the time. The noise it makes as it spun and the sensation when you'd spin it to select a number. <laughs> For some reason, it never ceased to amaze me as a kid. It is, as you say, far too specific to just be a coincidence, especially given that you didn't have prior knowledge of your grandpa's tragic accident. If you had known about it, then maybe it was some kind of mind priming, but that's not the case. And now time for the quote of the day. One of the keys to happiness is a bad memory. Rita Mae Brown. Well, think about it. What is memory? Memory is crystallizing the events of the past, to have them cataloged. And what is the greatest joy of life is to experience something new. So yes, if you have a bad memory and you forget what you've experienced before, you have a lot of reliving to do, and in fact, then life could be infinite. I think that is one of the keys to properly enjoy immortality. Life is grand. But there is a limit to how much new stuff you can experience. So if you have a device that can erase your memories selectively, then yeah, you could live forever and never get bored. That'd be pretty cool. We'll see if they get around to inventing that. Maybe Elon Musk with his Neuralink. I'm just hoping that it can help me cure these damn migraines if I go out into the sun. I don't really like being a vampire. Okay, so file 1338. The Night Shift Glitch. So a sleep study clinic within a haunted building, or specifically a haunted room, is about the most unfortunate place to have a sleep study clinic as I can imagine. Talk about outside interference. No one could sleep good there. As convinced as I am the majority of spirits are good and harmless, I don't think I'd manage to spend years working in a haunted place, even if it was a friendly ghost, and even if I needed the money. You're kind of one tough cookie to tough it out for years. Especially after a customer was complaining about dreams involving bodies inside the walls? Who knows? Wouldn't look myself, but it could just explain the bad juju. Okay, Sonsufa, 1339. The Lost Clothes. The missing garments are very creepy indeed. Did some entity manage to cause its disappearance? I don't think it's a human in this case, like those stories of people living in the walls or attic, since in that case there'd be signs, and this kind of thing would keep happening. Something entirely invisible, maybe. But something definitely took it. And it was intentional, given what was missing. Creepy for sure. And now time for the quote of the day. I always wanted a happy ending. Now I've learned, the hard way, 
that some poems don't rhyme and some stories don't have a clear beginning, middle, and end. Life is about not knowing, having to change, taking the moment and making the best of it without knowing what's going to happen next. Delicious ambiguity. Gilda Radner. It's the thrill of the unknown and indeed not knowing. I mean, think about it. If you knew everything that was going to happen, then there would be no excitement left. Do you really want that? People often, if they're gifted three wishes, they ask for ultimate knowledge to the ability to know everything. Maybe instead of automatically knowing everything, the power should be the ability to look it up, almost like a uh, cosmic Wikipedia, and just you could look up anything you wanted, but it has to be willed. You don't just automatically know everything that's going to happen, or any information about a given object or something or person. You have to intentionally will it, and then you know. Maybe then it could be fun, because there's sometimes, you know, nagging things that you want to know, the secrets to the universe, what's inside a black hole, all that kind of information. And knowing its objective would be rather neat. Yeah. <laughs> Quesantifa 1340. Glitches from behind the curtains. You know about that heat distortion effect you see often on a hot summer day over asphalt roads? The wavy shimmer in the air? Sounds exactly like this, but the distortion would have to be in space-time itself. So a ripple within a certain location, like between the vector of you and the plant, you were just seeing into a different universe where the plant was accelerated in time and it was still a real plant. That's the only thing I could think of that would cause this. Ripples in space-time. Weird stuff, for sure. <laughs> okay, so the bonus file. The Unexplained Hospital Ring Miracle. So there you have it, your own personal ghost stylist. <laughs> nice. It's a solid thing, right? The juxtaposition intended. For a ghost to give you a sign of his existence. So phasing out one ring while the chain is still intact, and it's no magic trick where the chain has a false link or something, no. It's as close to real magic as anyone can get. And I, it's not magic magic, but it's still like the scientific method, you know, testing, hypothesis, etc. In this case, it is very real and it really happens. But you're not going to find it in a science textbook, so you have to experience it yourself to truly believe it. This applies to me too. I read so many of these stories, and I, I believe they're true, but it's still almost just a theoretical belief until it happens to you. It's not deep in your soul. You know what I mean? And now time for the quote of the day. In every aspect of our lives, we are always asking ourselves, how am I of value? What is my worth? Yet I believe that worthiness is our birthright. Oprah Winfrey. Hey, an Oprah quote. I like Oprah. Giving away stuff. It's nice. But knowing your worth, right? What does that mean? Is there a cosmic judgment of worth? You know, someone weighing the scales and deciding if we, uh, if our intent was justified or if we're just good or bad people and then we're given a certain amount of stuff depending on that. I don't think it applies that way. I think worth is an internal aspect. It's a mindset. Do you believe you're worthy of love, uh, worthy of a good life? I think a lot of people Maybe because of trauma, maybe uh, because of how they were raised, they weren't given enough love and attention. They don't think that they're worthy of any of that stuff. That manifests in a lot of self-destructive behavior, which is very sad, and it's hard to peel away that trauma. And I mean, I'm not a therapist, I can't do that for anyone, but I do recommend therapy to people who do struggle, because it's not about cosmic judgment. Everyone, unless you're an actual evil person, in my view, is worthy of love and affection and a good life. I you know, it doesn't mean that you're worthy of a billion dollars or anything like that. I just mean that the simple things in life and to not be stressed out all the time, you know? A lot of that, though, is not really about what we deserve or how worthy we are. It's just about going out and carving out that slice of life for yourself. But really, it does depend on you believing you are worthy of that. Because if not, you won't have the will to go and carve out that life. Okay, so file 1341. The Tale of the White Feather. So a question, can our guardian angels interfere in our lives for random, small-scale stuff like a bad hip? Hmm. Remember in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, where Harry pretends to slip on his liquid luck, the potion that gives you more luck? Maybe those feathers were the same intent. So the idea is the guardian angel can't directly interfere, like directly heal you. But showing you a sign that guardian angels are real gives you the impression that they did. So your confidence level would kick in, and then you would just power through the pain because you thought it was healing. 
a kind of spiritually induced placebo effect. If I'm right and our guardian angels leave this small stuff up to us, then it doesn't mean they can't give us a confidence boost, you know, just give us a good little push. <laughs> it's wholesome, in a way, I think. Case Notes of File 1342 Writing with my doppelganger. Many of these doppelganger sightings stem from multiverse sight, as evidenced by the girl disappearing after she got off the bus. Whatever space time distortion enabled this was severed. It was. she walked out of the field, I guess you could say. Or maybe the distortion went away on its own. In fact, I'd wager that other people on that bus saw themselves too. Other versions of themselves. These aren't very common events, but they do happen. Okay, Sonsufal, 1343. The bizarre events of the desert truck stop. A small side note here. I highly respect truck drivers, and I think they don't get enough respect and recognition for their work. The long hours, always on the move, away from family, dealing with other drivers on the road constantly. No way I could do it. Not to mention the high level of skill that navigating towns and city streets, backing up into loading docks, etc. requires. Without truckers, nothing would get delivered to the supermarkets and stores, so invaluable. Many thanks. Sincerely. Now, could this have been a strange man trying to lure truckers out to rob them? I could see that. Though without any tracks on the ground, perhaps not. Good idea to loop the seatbelts through the door handles though, that's a good tip to keep. So I don't know if this was a glitch, something supernatural, or just weird human beings. Could be anything, really. You never found out and I hope you don't. <laughs> Case notes for file 1344. A glitch in the matrix at Ace Hardware. An omniscient demigorgon? <laughs> Let's leave that one in the back burner for now. Given her nonchalant reaction, this must have happened to her frequently, so much so that she's numb to the experience of having knowledge that she shouldn't have, almost like it finds its way on its own into her subconscious. It's like a dam with a small crack in it. Water can't help but get through. But then I wonder what happens if the dam completely overflows. Too much knowledge. Can our minds handle it all? It's like in Indiana Jones at the end where the person wanted that knowledge so much, but to the extent that it literally just fried their brains open. There's too much knowledge. Or of course, there's Stargate SG-1-2 with O'Neill downloading all the ancients' knowledge and his brain couldn't comprehend. Couldn't. It's like overloading a hard drive. It's rewriting things that you need to survive, the base layer programming. So yeah, I could see that too much knowledge would be a severe problem. But there's mechanisms that keep the dam pretty robust, even if there's cracks. It's not like concrete, which, if there's a crack, it's going to break eventually. In this case, it doesn't seem to happen. Good. Now time for the quote of the day. Always laugh when you can. It is cheap medicine. Lord Byron. I can't imagine cheaper medicine. Can you? And this pivots back to my rewatching of Friends. You can rewatch Seinfeld as well. How I Met Your Mother is de decent. There's Yes, Dear, Everybody Loves Raymond. There's so many good sitcoms that are just, you know, good, fun humor. And sometimes that's exactly what you need. You don't need pills from a bottle. You need laughter for the soul. Que Sonsofa, 1345. The day the chickens spoke. Amazing indeed. Chickens aren't as stupid as most think. Or maybe rather, no one does think about how clever they are. Same thing with cows and pigs and all that. An afterthought at best. But like... Humans can occasionally receive bursts of knowledge from the beyond. Can chickens too? It's all down to that soul, in my opinion. It's the interface enabling that ability, receiving that ability, receiving that boost. And I think that animals have it. Maybe not insects. There's a crossover point where I, d I don't know where a soul is instilled in a being, but I think that animals does do have it. And in this case, that's exactly what was needed. Maximiliano to save Poliana. Hell of the names. Okay, Sonsofa, 1346. Time lost, anxiety gone. The watch somehow was holding or causing a cloud of anxiety over you. So if cursed objects exist at all, this would be an excellent representation of the effect. An item, an object, imbued with negative energy, which could manifest in some people as anger, others in fear, and for you, anxiety. It wouldn't manifest evenly for everyone. In my opinion. Okay, Sonsofa, 1347. The quantum tomato. Not as wild as you might think. Whole people in cars are ported around the world all the time, usually in a more localized distance, which fits here, wasn't too far between stores. My guess is it wasn't just the singular rotten tomato that was ported over though, but a whole bunch of them that were in the same pile. You just didn't notice the others since they had no distinguishing features. 
And I do believe it was a porting event, because in all my life, going to stores, looking for tomatoes or other fruit, sometimes is rotten, rotten stuff, but it's extremely rare, and I don't think you'd find exactly two, two identical rotten tomatoes in different stores. That's very unlikely to me. Okay, so it's for the bonus file, The War Memorial Mystery. Spirits are bound to specific locations and patterns. If a soldier died overseas, their spirit would be rooted over there. If you did see a spirit, it must have died nearby that memorial area. Hmm. Was it a historical battlefield? Now time for the quote of the day. The meaning of life is just to be alive. It is so plain and so obvious and so simple. And yet everybody rushes around in a great panic as if it was necessary to achieve something beyond themselves. Alan Watts. So there's two sides to this. On one side, I greatly respect people who dedicate their lives to the pursuit of knowledge and betterment of mankind. Obviously, everything we have, this modern technology, wouldn't exist without people like that, who, in a certain sense, sacrifice their lives to improve all of mankind. No one is required to do that, and you're not a bad person if you don't. You can live the simplest of lives. There's a video by a YouTuber called Peter Santinello where he documented a person, you know, he went there himself. It was like an Amish guy who just lived off-grid, a very simple life. I don't think he even had electricity. He didn't even have a phone number. And he, uh, he wanted to, to, to date, some, you know, to put himself out there for girls to call him. So it was like a friend's number or something that uh, they gave out. Anyways, I just think there's a beauty in simple living too. So there's two sides. You know, again, I respect people who dedicate their lives to bettering mankind, furthering our knowledge, like Elon Musk taking us to the stars. It's incredible. But if that's not you, there's nothing wrong with that. Do not think that you're less just because you want to live a simple, peaceful life. You're not. That is entirely okay. Just don't harm other people. That's it. That's the only golden rule. Don't harm innocent people. If you're being attacked, feel free to defend yourself. <laughs> Okay, so it's file 1348. My quiche mutated before my eyes. It's not overthinking. Even if your sister's theory is plausible, it fades away to me when you consider the distribution. No restaurant I've ever been to has served a split omelet or quiche this way, unless specifically asked. And I don't think they would for allergy reasons. They have to serve you what you ordered, or was on the menu. So, a quantum quiche indeed, in superposition while not being observed. Whenever you looked away for that brief moment, it switched. Just the standard wild machinations of the universe. <laughs> Less so in love with the mutating quiche, though. Doesn't sound very appetizing. Mushrooms and zucchini? What's that? <laughs> no. Okay, so let's file 1349. The flight missed. The affair revealed. Betrayal unveiled. So not a whole lot I can say pisses me off and boils my blood, but this qualifies. Cheating. Look, it's not unreasonable to be unhappy in a relationship. You get together, you have good times, but down the road something changes or the magic is gone, you want different things, whatever it may be. You're unhappy. So the adult thing to do in that case is to break up. Cheating on your partner, however, is a total betrayal of trust and diminishes yourself. I mean, this is a person you presumably really liked or even loved, and then you betray her like that or him? You're cutting your own karmic foot and negatively impacting the ability of your partner to trust someone else in the future. It's just terrible. A soul scar. Now, I don't know if somehow, something about that negativity somehow enabled this unveiling of information in an impossible way, to know the name of the who, who he cheated with on some luggage bag that was traveling across in front of you in a random airport, but I do think it provided you with some level of closure, which can't take the pain away, but it's something at least. Okay, so let's file 1350. The Adirondack Aliens. The mind interfacing is the key detail that to me proves this is indeed an alien event. There are a few accounts of this now, where aliens directly connect to a human's mind, but apparently not other animals. Usually this leads to a sense of calm, but my guess is the connection doesn't always work. Think of a Bluetooth failing to connect properly. Then imagine that it's a trillion times more complex, so of course there's going to be errors. No matter how advanced these aliens might be, they're going to have Bluetooth issues <laughs> when dealing with a human mind. Good thing it doesn't seem to have any lasting effects. Now time for the quote of the day. I don't make jokes. I just watch the government and report the facts. Will Rogers. Yes, there's a lot of jokes when it comes to the government. 
won't go too deep there, but just to say, you know, the military industrial complex spending $40,000 on a toilet and, and all other kinds of things that are just irksome. And while it is a joke, it's not all that funny, is it? What can you do? Case notes are file 1351. I spoke a language I never learned. Having a partner who'd laugh at me for sharing something serious and yes, somewhat crazy in the colloquial sense of the word, how could I be with someone like that? Know what I mean? It's an issue of trust. If the partner you're with can't take you seriously even in those moments, I can't see a future in that. I definitely believe you. Initially, I was thinking, maybe you were having some kind of subtle stroke. There are signs of a stroke that involve language distortion, inability to speak, you can't understand what's being said, but also, you can't speak either. So, at least to my knowledge, you can't have a stroke, have language be distorted, but carry out a fluent conversation in that distorted language that is in reality just English or whatever the normal language is you speak. So, barring some strange medical issue like that, what if this was a parallel world where the language they developed over there was radically different, and you were inhabiting the body of that person, the you in that universe, which would have all the memories and knowledge of how to speak that language? So I suppose it's not too impossible. Languages can alter significantly if the universe's changes were made centuries ago. They ripple out in time and have lasting, massive impact over the course of centuries. Case notes are file 1352. The upside down photo frame mystery. Yeah, a pretty straightforward one in this case. It's just an error in the loading of the object, the reloading, that is. A picture frame in this case, yeah. It reloaded, but just with improper orientation in the spatial axis. Flipped over. <laughs> Strange, but actually pretty simple. Case file number 1353. Who is the mystery man who saved my life? Okay, guardian angel event, and in this case, he possessed the body of that man, saving may be slightly annoyed with all the warnings he gave you that you still weren't paying enough attention. Of the dangers in crossing the road. I mean, fair enough. Look both ways, right? And outside of the glitch realm, I think this should be a PSA blasted all over all the time. We're addicted to our phones now, it's true. But when we're out and about, we should be aware of our surroundings. It can literally save your life. We won't always have a guardian angel on our back able to step in and provide that divine intervention. And if you don't have one, you have to be your own guardian angel. That starts with paying attention. Que sans 1354, when the future whispered to me. I'm sure it can feel this way, but I don't think there's anything nefarious or malicious involved with your foresight gift. And I think it is indeed a gift, even if you can't control it, or at least don't know how to yet. Curious though, the foresight to an actual glitch, the sounds and thuds of something that isn't even there. I suppose you could see into the future even to a point where it's not loaded or rendered correctly, even to the point where it's unstable. And now time for the quote of the day. Reading is to the mind what exercise is to the body. Sir Richard Steele. And the great thing with technology is now, in these modern times, you have a phone. You can download Audible or... There was another app where it condensed an entire book down to like 15 minutes, the corn nuggets. Forgot what it was. Blinkist, I think it is not sponsored or anything, I just uh, thought it was an interesting concept. Because yes, reading is great, but you don't have to physically read like a book. You could read online, text online, you can have someone read to you. Auto, uh, you know, Audible is great for that. It's just downloading information into your mind and sometimes new programs. You're loading information onto your hard drive or SSD, I guess the mind's pretty quick. Keep loading new programs in, just make sure they're not viruses. That's the only difficulty. Case on Sofa, 1355. The radio mystery that left us speechless. Trying to calculate the odds of this as a purely coincidence. You'd have to know those two stations and their repertoire of available songs and then cross-reference based on your own pool of songs that you know in your head. That they have to overlap and your selection be exactly, precisely at the same time, the same verse, the same thing being said. <laughs> We're talking about astronomical birth of single-cell life in the primordial pool a billion years ago. Odds. Pretty rare. I can't pretend to know what causes this exactly. I like to attribute it to knowledge floating in the air, but that's rather abstract. I have no concrete explanation for how you knew what was going to be played, but somehow your subconscious was fed this information or grabbed it. For what reason? Eludes me. Okay, sounds for the bonus file. My cat and daughter's incredible reincarnation saga. This story reminds me of the episode in Friends where Phoebe believes her grandma is reincarnated into her. Soul sharing, you could say. 
If I had to guess, I think that's entirely possible. The idea of being possessed is well known. It's a malicious sharing. But what about cohabitation? It's like having a roommate. It's the difference between, say, a robber breaking into your home and a stranger being invited in. Or at least someone appearing and saying, yeah, can I stay? Yeah, sure, no problem. Reincarnation, though, it does make perfect sense. It's like reshuffling the deck, but it's still the same deck. Now time for the quote of the day. Love is a difficult realization that something other than oneself is real. Iris Murdoch. And I would add to this and not just say that someone else is real, but someone else matters as much as you do. You know, we have this when you have children too, I imagine, but it's the same principle. I think most people are inherently, to some extent, solipsistic, where we only care about ourselves, we only think about ourselves like main character syndrome, and it's hard to disconnect from that. To really appreciate that there are other people out there, and they have lives as rich as yours, and thoughts, and terrors, and everything that you can imagine, just as rich as yours, in different formats, sure. To find someone that you can truly not just logically understand that, but empathize and truly believe that they matter as much as you do. Well, outside of immediate family, you just don't get that. It's finding that other piece of yourself. It's not just, I don't believe in a single soulmate. I think there's multiple people that would fit that bill for us. It's just a matter of finding them, and then you have that other piece of yourself. Hard to live without that, isn't it? Okay, so that's file 1356. My old radio had a will of its own. A haunted radio? Possessed by the essence of whoever owned it prior? These objects of meaning can bind part of a spirit to them, almost like the Horcrux in Harry Potter, but in this case, unintentional and not requiring murder, which is good. <laughs> Strong emotion is my guess. Emotion is a, this flaring of the soul, and those tendrils can lash on to things. One thing is for sure, and on my end, when I get my off-grid cabin in the remote woods, I'm not going to be buying any antique furniture or radios. Who knows what's imbued in them? Play it safe. <laughs> You're out there all alone. Case fall number 1357. The day I saw blood in the mirror. A vivid flash of the past. I think you witnessed the aftermath of a murder that took place in that restaurant in the bathroom area. Maybe a long time ago, but very disturbing flash. And I wouldn't want to experience that, but probably what happened. Now time for the quote of the day. I have the consolation of having added nothing to my private fortune during my public service, and of retiring with hands clean as they are empty. Thomas Jefferson. You get a lot of that these days, don't you? Corruption in government. I mean, you have public servants that go into office with a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year, I mean a good salary, but then they come out with tens of mil hundreds of millions of dollars? How how does that happen? I don't really buy it. You know, oh, they got book deals or they sold art or something. Yeah, they, they that's a way to get around the bribing laws. <laughs> it's what government tends to attract, people who have no uh, scruples, <laughs> you could say. Not the best people. Case notes of file, 1358. My entire reality was shattered on K10. Survival instincts kicked in, in not recording it. Always listen to your gut. I'll never stop hammering that point in. I think aliens are here, but I also think, given the various descriptions of ship types, that there's more than one species around. It's even possible some are hostile and others are benevolent or neutral, and don't let the other species interact as much. There could even be rogue agents within a certain species, you know, just like we aren't a collective. There's good people and bad people and mad scientists. Maybe that is a case for aliens too. They're not necessarily the Borg, all of one mind. Something about the triangle ship evokes in me the same irrational, or I guess rather, a fear I can't put into words. And that's just from reading the stories and seeing it through my mind's eye, what I imagine it or what uh, the AI generator can muster up. It's very deeply disturbing indeed. Case notes of file 1359. I knew my family was in danger. Calming you down with ice cream is just so random and funny to me, especially given that it would have worked on me too. <laughs> ah, children. We were simple creatures back then. Heck, it'd work on me today as an adult, so hey. <laughs> Wonder how your parents reacted after the fact. It wasn't a full-on crash, but surely they must have thought you had something special going on. Or I guess maybe they were just like normal people, right? Unwilling to consider it as anything more than a coincidence, because why would you possibly think there's more to the world than meets the eye? Can't allow that. Case notes file 1360. The onslaught of glitches. It's that confluence of glitches you described after that sends light bulbs in my mind. Is this part of where the original multiverse glitch happens? Some kind of space-time portal is involved in separating you two temporarily. 
so you're occupying different worlds. But then when restored, one or both of your code was corrupted. Not until it was fixed did those other glitches cease. It's a very interesting theory, but of course very disturbing too. <laughs> if you're uh, involved in some space-time event, maybe take things lightly, because maybe your code isn't properly restored after the teleportation. Now time for the quote of the day. Life begins the same way it ends, in nothing. Me. I was thinking about this the other day, and uh, if you think about it, before you're born, you don't exist. You're floating in this abstract void of emptiness, of nothing, pure nothing. And then when you die, you return exactly to the same place, in nothing. You just don't exist. So if you emerged from nothing, you were born to exist now from nothing, then presumably it's possible, maybe not guaranteed, but possible, logically, that when you die, you can re-emerge just like that. And this is, you know, discounting the idea of heaven, hell, religious afterlife, and the simulation. If all that isn't true, you just die, and now you're in this empty void of nothingness. You don't exist. But then there could be a spark, and now you exist. Just like it, ha it already happened. So why couldn't it happen again? It's basically reincarnation without a directed purpose, but you could just re-emerge. Hopefully only as humans, but maybe as an alien in a distant galaxy, or as an animal. I don't know. Whatever could have a soul, I guess. I find that very comforting, in a way. Because I love life. I love the game. <laughs> I don't want it to just end. Not necessarily that I'm afraid of it ending, more that it just would suck, because life is great. Que sont so 1361. The cryptic, time-bending lady. Yes, of course, she casted Obliviate to alter your memories. A powerful sorceress indeed. He even described her looking as one. In all seriousness, though. We're of course dealing with a multiverse transition mishap. The woman may be entirely unrelated, just a lady with poor social skills. Because to my knowledge, no individual human being has ever been able to will a transition between multiverses. It just happens, for one reason or another. Especially not willed onto someone else. So I mean, if she did, that would actually make her kind of a sorceress indeed. Maybe, but I don't know how. I have no idea how. Case notes are the bonus file. A ball of light and the miracle in the dark. So you pulled a cord in the bathroom? Never heard of a light fixture in there requiring the pulling of a cord. You mean unplugging it? Or you meant like one of those dangling chains usually connected to a ceiling fan? I was curious. Hmm, so this ball of light, presumably what most think of as ball lightning, but may in fact be kind of a spiritual energy, condensed spiritual energy, only emerged after disconnecting the electric circuit. Was this electric field somehow containing this ball of energy? Would make some level of sense. One can affect the other. It has to go both ways then, right? So if you're ever being attacked by a spirit, maybe it isn't salt you need. Maybe you need a giant EM field generator that'll block it out literally with a field. It actually makes quite a bit of sense. Just remembering this now too, by the way. It was a flashback of my mom saying something to me about a ball of light entering her when she was pregnant with me. I wonder how this relates. What are these balls of light? Did that somehow reincarnate me? Or was it some energy trying to protect me? I don't know if it's related at all, but I just remember that happening. That's an interesting parallel from my life. Wow. Now time for the quote of the day. Everywhere is walking distance, if you have the time. Stephen Wright. Very true. Although, there are some better areas to walk in than others. I'm in a strange spot when it comes to... If you live in a rural place, which is where I want to live, there isn't much infrastructure on the road unless you have a car. I mean, there's not going to be a sidewalk, but usually there isn't even like a curbside on the, the road, on a back road. So really, if there's a space for a car and that's it, if you want to walk, you kind of have to walk against traffic and just walk on the, the grass for a bit to let cars pass? It's not exactly the most pleasant of experiences is all. But it is great exercise. Highly underrated. Case Notes of Foul, 1362. The strange tale of the man made out of wood. A Bug's Life. Such an underrated movie. Been forever since I thought about it too. Ants was really good too. So your mind somehow predicted an object from your future. Or maybe the dream was more of an accident? Not meaning anything even though the nightmare was drawing on a possible future inclusion in your life, just some random object. I don't think these always mean anything, like this wood figure means you're going to die by a tree collapsing on you or something like that. I don't think that's, it's nothing like that. I think our brain's internal structure is a form of chaos, trying to be tempered desperately by our subconscious. 
It is our brain trying to temper our brain. <laughs> when we dream, we enter that realm of chaos and watch a battle of order ensue. But in this chaos, there's a lot of future information, past information, maybe information from other universes too. It's all jumbled in a giant mess, and our subconscious is trying to sort it out, as well from our experiences of the day and keep what we need, which is part of why we have to sleep. Is it not your brain just, it's like a hard drive that's never formatted. It just is overloaded and messed up and you can't find anything in there. With good sleep, you have better memory, for sure. Case notes of file 1363. My glasses pulled a Houdini act. Say it with me now. I'm not crazy. The multiverse is crazy. Occasionally, the items that end up going missing by this crazy multiverse are too specific to be a coincidence, in my opinion leading me to the conclusion that it can be willed to happen by some kind of entity or conscious force. Now, don't get me wrong, coincidences do happen, they really do, but in this case I just don't buy it. And maybe that's my own bias, I don't know. Maybe there is, maybe it is just random coincidence in this case too, for, even for glasses. But something tells me there's more to it. What do you think? Day. Case notes of file 1364. The glowing pink bag that defied reality. The logical solution to this conundrum, in my mind, is a kind of trade between multiverse universes. Your bag was taken, moved over to an adjacent universe, and from there, your salad was moved over here. Your salad in the other universe. So the bowl, including all those little details like the sticker you couldn't fully remove. It was still your bowl, so this makes perfect sense. I do wonder if this is always the case though, that items have to be traded, maybe in a certain level of mass equivalency? So if that's the case, there was more than just the salad bowl that was ported over to this original universe, because the bag was much heavier than a salad bowl. Maybe that's why items go missing sometimes at random. Maybe because our universe received extra mass or energy. So some has to be removed to restore balance, and those items are just chosen at random. Maybe they aren't chosen at random though. That's another thought. But I think this mass equivalency makes sense. The universes can't be overloaded. And now time for the quote of the day. When I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. And that is my religion. Abraham Lincoln. Ah yes, religion. The sins that try to guide our behavior and even our thoughts. I think there's value in that. But I think as long as you are a decent human being, you can go by the golden rule. Do unto others as you would do unto yourself. That's it. If you actually apply that, then you don't need religion to be a good person, in my opinion. Now, the trick is, there are some people who are sociopaths, psychopaths, they're not always bad, but they don't have the same um, empathy towards other people. So a purely logical approach can still work, but it's not as tempered, it's not as guided. If you have emotion, you're going to be much less likely to harm someone else. If you're just operating purely on logic, eh, can be tricky, and some people think they can get away with it. Oh, I can treat this person bad, break the golden rule, and it'll never come back to me. Now usually it does, not even in a karmic sense, just as a natural flow of the universe. But sometimes they do get away with it. A long-winded way to say that religion isn't necessary, but it can add an extra layer, because if someone is a sociopath, but they believe there's an afterlife and they'll be punished if they're bad here, they'll be less likely than if they're purely following a logical context of morality, like do unto others as you would do unto yourself. That's not always enough for everyone. Like the video, subscribe, hit the bell. Kinetic Symphony, signing off.